Um, sorry, we were just talking about uh, Manny's life and times. So, um, uh, so what's his? He he has this elaborate claim where he he sees him himself as being the fourth of a series of legitimate revelations, so to speak. Um, and there are other people who've had claims of series of legitimate uh, revelations, but his is different from some other some other people's. His are uh, Buddha, uh, Zoroaster, and Jesus, and then himself. Um, uh, so uh, not quite clear if it's Buddha and then Zoroaster or the other way around, but uh, that's the order in which he gives them. Um, uh, so each of those uh, he considers a, um, a kind of true faith tradition, a, a, a church that gave a, uh, a religion of insight about the uh, transcendental to its own people in sort of the language of the people of its time. And he thinks that he is um, uh, following the tradition of all of those uh, culminating and perfecting them. Um, he claims that uh, it was in a particular you know, year that he you know, started having uh, 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 these visions and revelations uh, that, that uh, he's basing us on, which he considers a visitation of the Holy Spirit, uh, which is how he call, what, he, what he calls it. Um, and uh, uh, what he actually uh, gives is this, um, is a, passed into religion, religious history as a byword. Man Manichaeism means dualism. It means an original principle of good and original principle of evil, um, neither of which is the origin of the other. They're both uh, co-eternal, they're there from the beginning. Um, and this is something he's primarily getting from uh, the background of Zoroastrianism uh, in, in Iran, right? The, there is a primal uh, good and a primal evil, the, the, the principle of light and the principle of darkness um, that are uh, at war from the foundations of the world, right? Um, and uh, uh, he's going to explain sort of man's place in that war. And the traditional Zoroastrian uh, thing on that was just that, um, uh, man has to morally make a choice of which side he's on in that war. And that's the sort of moral drama in Zoroastrianism. And a lot of that is still there in Manichaeism, but with this addition of a, a whole um, uh, elaborate Gnostic uh, visionary explanation of uh, how the world came to be this way that you don't get in original Zoroastrianism. Um, uh, and there's elements of his um, aesthetic ethics in particular um, that seem to come from Buddhism. And there's elements of his uh, belief in revelation and the Holy Spirit and this sort of stuff, which seems to come from a Gnostic version of Christianity. Um, but he's tying all these things together in a kind of um, syncretic way. That's just a basic background of what he's doing. A few other things about Manichaeanism as a religion, which he kind of founded. Um, it was already getting a little bit established in Persia at the time understood he's, he's coming around at the same time that there's this, um, uh, a political revival in Persia, the Sassanid uh, monarchy is, you know, breaking away from uh, the uh, Roman or um, uh, Greek world, um, Hellenistic world, um, and is reestablishing Persian traditions, including the kind of revival of Zoroastrianism, um, which initially kind of favors the Manichaeans, and then some of them turn, kind of turn against uh, the Manichaeans and see it as a rival. Uh, to traditional uh, um, Zoroastrian. Do you have a question? I just want to make sure I clarified or that I get clarification. Yep. Um, when we're talking about his, you're talking about on um, page two, make sure I have the right page. Uh, the well, first digit is visitation by the Holy Spirit. Yes. I don't know why, but I. Uh, maybe it's because of the way they, is it Art Artisher was the king. Um, and I, I kind of somehow confused that he thought that Artisher was almost like, um, was, this, was this the living? Well, that's, I, I so missed, Ar he's, missed he's, he's, he's saying that his revelation started at the time when Artisher was king of Persia. Right. Uh, he says that's when he grew up and reached maturity. In that particular, when Artisher, and then unfortunately the manuscript is bad. And so we don't know what he said. He was trying to tell you which year of Artisher's reign it was by citing okay. some event that happened then. But the manuscript is so bad, we can't tell what event it was. So we can't tell yeah. the particular year he's claiming this happened. Right. But it was, was sometime, in the, in, sometime in the in the reign of Ar uh, Artisher, King of Persia. Um, and he says, then the living paraclete came down upon me and spoke to me, yeah. right? So that, that's the beginning of his, his claim of revelation. Um, and it's in his book called uh, Kephali, or the, the chapter headings, the headings. Um, uh, but uh, he's just trying to date um, uh, when it happened. We know that has to be before 241 because that's when Artisher died. So um, he, he must have, uh, uh, claiming this revelation happened sometime uh, before the year 241 AD, which means he would have been like 26 years old. 
something like that. So this is a revelation he claims he's having in his 20s. <clears throat> um, I do have a number of questions on that particular page, but I can wait till the end to get to them if you don't. Sure, know. sure. Yeah. What, was, what was the age that Muhammad had his visions? I think it's supposed to be later. I think it's closer to 40, but I, I don't know. Not, yeah, yeah. Speaking of which, the uh, uh, Muhammad also says that there are three legitimate revelations before him, but they are um, Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, not uh, Buddha or Zoroaster, right? The only one they agree on is Jesus. Um, but uh, let's talk a little about the historical range of Manichaeism. So, so um, as I say, it's founded in the third century. It spreads very rapidly into the West as far as you know, uh, uh, Rome and uh, uh, North Africa. We know that it was a live issue for um, uh, Augustine in his day. Um, uh, Diocletian, who's also persecuting the Christians, persecutes the Manichaeans, uh, at least as ferociously. Um, and then some of the later Christian emperors also persecuted in the fourth century or so, but it's still surviving just for a few hundred years in the West. Um, it makes a much bigger impact in the Near East, Persia, and into Central Asia. And the Central Asian connection winds up going all the way to the borders of China. There are Manichaean sects founded in China around 750 or so. There are uh, Chinese emperors persecuting against it, saying that it's confusing people by claiming to be Buddhism, uh, which it actually isn't. But uh, there is a, a major um, empire in what is now Central, well, a, a Turkish empire in what is now Central Asia to Mongolia, uh, same ter territory as the predecessors, the Mongols, uh, hundreds of years before the Mongols, where Manichaeanism becomes the state religion um, for several hundred years. Um, the Uyghurs that we hear about in the news are descendants of that same group. Um, uh, so the, 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 uh, they converted to Buddhism a few, a few centuries later before the uh, Muslim conquest. Well, most of the Manichaeans of Central Asia either converted to B Buddhism or conquered by the Mongols or both in not in that order, right? Um, uh, but there were some Manichaean sects that survived in China into the high middle ages. Um, uh, Okay, so that's sort of something about its historical extent. It, it's, a, it's a big deal in the whole Near East and in Central Asia um, uh, throughout the Dark Ages up until the uh, Mongol conquests in the Near East and well after them uh, in Central Asia. By the time of the Mongols though, it's all gone basically, except a few holdouts in, in China. Um, so that's sort of extent of it as a kind of world religion on the, on the stage, so to speak. There are other um, survivals of uh, Manichaeanism in the Eastern Roman Empire down to at least the um, sixth century. Um, and there are claims that, that people like the Bogomils and the Cathars in the Middle Ages are a revival of Manichaeanism. In part though, that may be because whenever they see a heretic, uh, the Christians at that time say Manichaean um, because they get all their notions of heresy from Augustine who, um, famously went from Platonic philosophy to Manichaeanism to Christianity. Anyway, so this is just a little bit of background on its sort of spatial extent. Um, okay, uh, so I wanna point out a couple of things. Uh, um, uh, Jonas points out that Manny wants to found a world religion. He's not just making a little sect inside of a existing Christian thing. And I think that's correct, but he still does have this notion of these uh, uh, he, he, three, three tiers and three types, just as the Gnostics had their um, spirituals and their uh, psychic and their uh, uh, fleshy people. Um, uh, Manny also has the, um, uh, the perfect enlightened or pure, which might be what the Cathars later were, uh, the helpers or fighters who defend uh, 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 Manichaean religion, but do not actually adopt all the ascetic ways that it calls for. Um, and then the... Uh, the fleshy on the outside, right? Uh, uh, worldly people who have nothing to do with spiritual things, right? So the point is that uh, uh, it's not the case that it doesn't have this distinction between the enlightened or elect as a, as a purist uh, central group and the hangers on around it. It, it, has, it shares that in common with other versions of Gnosticism. Um, the other thing that I wanna bring out just because Jonas doesn't is um, there's a curious reversal of the role of um, uh, creation of the cosmos and creation of man in Manichaeanism as opposed to the Syrian or Valentinian versions of Gnostics we talked about more last time. Um, we saw last time that uh, the Valentinians, you know, 
put down the uh, creation of the visible world to uh, a being less than God who is at most just, if not outright evil, um, but not good. Um, and that's uh, a uh, the uh, the God of the Old Testament um, is a, is their <coughs> is their version of the Creator as uh, not a good God who is not the true High <clears throat> God um, to the to the Valentinians. The point of that is that uh, um, I'm listening. Sorry. The, the point the point of that is that there is a, a sort of negative valuation on the creation of the world. Right, the creation of the world is, is for a bad purpose. Um, and then uh, the creation of man is presented in that uh, as something which, uh, yes, the creator God tries to do in his arrogance, so to speak, but uh, 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 Sophia, uh, his mother, uh, causes man to be um, imbued with actual spirit and to be more like the high God than like uh, uh, his immediate creator, right? So in a sense, there's something um, foreshadowing redemption in the invention of man and something um, uh, uh, dark or bad about the creation of the world, of the uh, visible world, so to speak. In Manichaeism, some of that's reversed. In Manichaeism, it's the creation of the world, which is a device of the high God for separating light from darkness, for retrieving the uh, lost and trapped <laughs> particles of light, right? So there's a, there is a, um, it is, they are going to share viewing the world as something like a place where this, where spirit is trapped from which it is trying to escape. But, uh, Manny presents the creation of the world as a, a mechanism for, cause, for causing that separation to occur. Um, so that's uh, a, slight, a significant difference, I would say, in the valuation of um, visible cosmos or something like that. Um, and then on the other hand, um, Manny ca calls the, cre uh, the creation of man an act of the, um, of, the uh, of Araman or, or of, uh, the, the, of, of the devil figure in, in, in Manichaeism, right? Um, uh, there's something, uh, not, not only that, it's uh, um, uh, man, man as mortal, finite, and uh, a sexually reproducing being is a, is a means of keeping uh, the, a spirit entrapped in matter forever, or trying to. Um, so uh, the point that I'm making is there's this same uh, picture of the world as kind of a place of the prison of spirit in both, of, in both Valentinian and Manichaean Gnosticism. But in Manichaeanism, um, there's less of a good accent on man and more of a good accent on cosmos than you get in the Valentinian or Syrian version. Um, and that's a striking revision to me. Um, uh, it's uh, uh, way more down on man than, than the Valentinians were and uh, not nearly as hostile to cosmos. Um, yeah. we'll so I have that. a question. Sure, go ahead. I have a question there when you talk about uh, God being, uh, you know, uh, an e evil God like the Old Testament, is this where they believe that Lucifer was the light bearer and he was? Uh... Not, not specifically. I mean, in in the in uh, in the Valentinian Gnostics, right? They uh, uh, they they don't have a Lucifer figure, right? Um, unlike the Manichaeans. But they view the uh, God of the Old Testament as a, a creator God who is less than the high God. The, the high good God yes. is completely outside the world and didn't make it. Um, uh, but there's uh, uh, what, what is doing the enlightening in, in, in the Garden of Eden in, in, in Valentinian Gnosis. It's something like uh, uh, Sophia, uh, uh, Pistis Sophia, or Suffering Wisdom, or something like that. Um, the, in the case of the Manichaeans, uh, they do have a kind of a uh, devil figure. Uh, he is not part of the, um, certainly not a good part of the, uh, of the creation story. I mean, well, that's not quite right. Um, uh, anything like an Eden story. Um, the devil of Manichaeanism is not Lucifer, it's Araman. It's the spirit of darkness of Zoroastrianism, um, uh, where the contrast is between uh, Ahura Mazda or Lord Wisdom and uh, um, Araman or darkness, darkness personified. The uh, Jonas points out that the word that is often used for Araman is is the same word the Greeks use for matter. So there's a way in which this light and dark is also spirit and matter. It may also have echoes of Taoism, <laughs> um, but there there is a uh, 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 the point is that they it's not a um, anything like a uh, 
Christian Lucifer figure is involved in the, the dark principle of Manichaeism. It's, it's this Araman figure out of Zoroastrianism. Now that said, the uh, sort of war of angels and devils view that we consider typically Christian is probably more Zoroastrian than it is Christian or at least religionally so. Um, uh, but that's a, that's a different story. That's not even just Manichaeism, that's the background he's coming from. Um, that's where we get this, this idea of um, uh, armies of angels fighting armies of devils for the souls of men, right? That's the, that's the Zoroastrian picture of, of, of the drama of existence. Um, does that help? Yep, yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, I want to give... That was one of the questions I had as well. I was wondering okay. about the roots of Zoroastrianism in that. So you just answered it, thanks. Okay, uh, I wanna get some of your other questions. There's, there's, um, there's lots of other things I could talk about, about um, Manny, both about his background and his doctrines. Um, we'll get into some of the details of that in, in, in a bit, but um, I wanna give you a chance to ask questions about either anything about Manny life and times historical extent or anything about sort of basic core doc doctrines and how he is agreeing with or disagreeing with um, existing, uh, well, not existing, the, the Valentinian stuff we were talking about last time. Um, so Jim, this is a perfect chance for you to throw all your questions at me from this chapter. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, I guess the, the first, you answered the, one of them. There's another one, just a historical note. Um, any documentation about why he was crucified? Because it mentioned in the book that he was crucified, says uh, he was crucified under his successor, Baram, uh, in about 275 AD. So uh, is there any actual is, is that the uh, consensus view on how he met his end? Yes, there are some, there's, some, there's some that say that he died while awaiting execution as opposed to having actually been crucified. That's the only disagreement about that su subject. But um, uh, the, the basic thing that's going on is he is not in Babylon, he's in Persia. And uh, the uh, Persians are in the middle of a uh, traditional Zoroastrian revival uh, as the state religion of the Sanasids. And uh, originally they saw Manichaeanism as a uh, congenial enough similar thing that they were sort of uh, okay with it, but by the time that he's you know persecuted, it's not. It's the 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 old the old Magi as Rastrian priest, priests want the old religion to come back, and they don't want this thing which is amalgamated with Christianity and Buddhism replacing it. Um, mm -hmm. They view all those things as foreign imports. So he's considered a a heretic from the standpoint of the Zoroastrians, um, and dangerous to the state because it's the state religion that he is heretically undermining. Um, so that that's the reason that he's, it's the immediate reason that he's persecuted. Okay. I had one other question. I think it probably was already answered and this is a stretch in, again, on that page, same page, he talks about- um, Sorry, which page? Uh, 214, I believe, or is it 209? You were at 208 before. Yeah, 208, 208, you're right. Yep. Uh, I, he says that um, <clears throat> light and darkness, the mystery of the conflict and the great war, which darkness stirred up, he revealed to me how the light turned back, overcame the darkness by intermingling. Now, I thought at first, I was wondering if that was some type of reference to Jesus Christ, because I know that the Gnostic sort of had an amalgamation and he also, it was also part of his eschatology. I didn't see that as being a part of eschatology. It seemed like more of a reference to um, creation myth. Uh, so, so I, I think sure. I think I think this is this is places where he he's noticing some parallels with uh, either Genesis or Christianity, but the direct thing he's referring to is Zoroastrian, right? Yeah. The Zoroastrian war of light against darkness. Um, so uh, that's sort of his basic the, the basic thing he's referring to here. Um, but you know he 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 tells you about you know Adam and the tree of knowledge in the very next sentence, which is showing you how he's 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 tying together all of these. Zoroastrian traditions with with Christian traditions yeah. um, or, or biblical traditions, right? So, uh, um, but the, the the basic, as he says, the, the mystery of light and darkness, the mystery of the conflict, the great war which the darkness stirred up, that's all um, straight Zoroastrianism. Okay, yeah, because I guess I'm trying to parse out his method of syncretism. You know, like I see all these, like you said, immediate references back and forth, and I'm like, wow, man, this is quite an interesting mix. Yes, but I mean his his own account of what the what this what the origin of the syncretism is. It's what the Holy Spirit told him was true, right? Now yeah. you can psychologize that into what influenced him, what what seemed convincing to him, and the things that had influenced him for all the different traditions he had imbibed. But you know he 
he's a 25 or 26 year old man coming out of a Gnostic sect living in Babylon who knows about Jesus and Buddha and Zoroaster, and he's telling you what the Holy Spirit revealed to him. Right. So that's his own understanding of it. Now we can, you know, try to psychologize, as I say, psychologically parse the influences on him from the outside. The particular thing he's talking about there is um, Zoroastrian or Persian. Right. Okay. Um, uh, so good question. I, I want to talk about some of the other places where there's sort of other traditions behind him. Um, there's places where he, you know, he talks about, you know, the different ages and the different nets that were used to, uh, 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 war against dark, uh, uh, darkness. Um, the thing you have to understand there is a lot of that is referring back to Marduk and Tiamat and Babylonian myth. Um, the, the the nets whereby uh, 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 the, the, the high god or the good god overcomes chaos. Right? Uh, Tiamat is a uh, uh, is matter and water and chaos, uh, chaos, something like that. All of those things together um, and uh, in the Babylonian uh, uh, cosmology, um, uh, the high guard Marduk goes out and defeats her uh, by throwing a net over her, a net made out of words, by the way. Um, so it's something like conceptual understanding of chaos. Um, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, having defeated her makes the ordered world out of her body, right? Um, the body of matter, right? So uh, some, this is something like uh, how uh, spirit or understanding or uh, logos uh, orders or or um, uh, orders chaos or matter for uh, for human purposes something like that um, that's sort of in the original Babylonian story but you see a bunch of echoes of that here um, because his dark principle has to also be his matter principle right and his higher light principle also has to be his order principle so he's he's bringing out a comp a, a, a parallel tradition in this understanding of uh, order and chaos or spirit and matter um, uh, that was already there both in Zoroastrianism and in Babylonian myth. And he's using some of the languages of Babylonian myth to talk about it because he's noticing that parallel. Um, there's other places where he talks about these things in terms of um, uh, the different, the different uh, 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 elements in ways that remind you of, remind, remind me of Empedocles um, in, in, in Greece. Greece, uh, Empedocles has also got some of these weird Indian kind of influences on him, uh, the same sort of doctrines of, um, uh, of reincarnation, the same kind of uh, ascetic quietism, uh, worried about harming anything alive uh, that you get in Empedocles. Um, and then there's other place where he talks about, uh, uh, he has the, the high spirit say, uh, or, uh, say, uh, I, am, I, am the I am the life in everything, right? He's trying to explain how um, the, the uh, original Jesus, the light Jesus, uh, um, uh, orders or informs everything in the world. Um, and the language there is very similar to, um, how to put it this way, um, the, same, the same sort of notion of uh, the spirit of light in everything. Uh, so whenever this, I'm looking at page 229, right? Um, uh, Okay, I am in everything, I bear the skies, I am the foundation, I support the earth, I am the light that shines forth and gives joy to the souls. I am the life of the world, I am the milk that is in all the trees, I am the sweet water that is beneath the suns of matter. Right, so all of that is something you could easily get in any of the um, uh, Syrian or Egyptian uh, 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 spirit of natural uh, fertility cults, right? The Dionysian cults, the, 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 the uh, 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 Attis cults, right? Um, uh, the, the same kind of stuff that um, um, you find in Fraser in the Golden Bow, right? All of that is 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 is, is, the, is in that too. The point that I'm bringing out here is that there's all of these places where Manny is plugging into a pre-existing strata of myth, and he's interpreting the parts that agree with him positively and incorporating them into what he's saying. Um, in doing so, he's definitely you know, throwing out huge portions of each of those previous traditions, right? He's not agreeing with all those previous traditions, but he, he is also, um, put it this way, appealing to anyone who uh, takes those things seriously and incorporating what he thinks is right in them, something like that. Um, so that's one of the things which is noticeable um, in Manny is this, I mean, he's, he's a syncretist. Uh, he's putting lots of different traditions together from uh, from Egypt to India, um, 
but uh, always in this um, assimilating myth way. He's not going to, the myth is not going to tell him which part of the myth he should take seriously. He knows that himself. He knows that himself from his own vision and from his own understanding, um, but he's going to see echoes of it in uh, what he sees as wisdom in each of the previous traditions. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, Jim, I'm interrupting your questions. You have more questions. Yeah, I have a, a, a bunch. And like I said, if it gets too much, uh, I'll tell you what, nope. let me go from 2.13 to 2.30. Uh, that, that I have questions I need to uh, through there and then yep. you, you can go after that. Uh, so um, there is one where it's on page 2.13, boundaries of light, when they beheld the light, a slight wondrous and glorious by far superior by their own. Anyway, finishes that all matter, the darkness, uh, and conferred how they could mingle with the light. My question was, it seems like an, F, an early reference to the assertion of a boundary with no wall. Why the emphasis on boundaries, but no walls? Right, so uh, uh, it's, a fair, it's a fair question. I mean, one might be that there were some other Gnostic traditions which you know personified limit as the, right, had an actual deity called limit that was at the boundary of the plumera in, in Gnostic, and he's not having any of that, right? Uh, oh, okay. uh, he, he, he's he's uh, distinguishing uh, his understanding of relations light and darkness from anything like a uh, Neoplatonic uh, uh, Valentinian pl plumera. So there's no personified limit between one and the other. That's one thing. Um, but the other thing is, this is why they uh, are immediately at war with one another, right? There, there's, there's uh, the, what limit does for the Valentinians is not just, uh, it, among other things, it separates the world, uh, the world from the heaven, so to speak. Uh, there's nothing like that here. Um, all of this is the the imagination may be material, but all of this is supposed to be before anything like our material world exists, right? So um, uh, no boundary between them. Um, it's funny to think of light as a material thing like this, <laughs> imagine imagination wise, right? But light is picked because it is the least material material thing, if you get me. Right, um, the most spirit-like uh, uh, thing that you can have a palpable intuition uh, uh, experience of is light. Um, Sounds sorry. like uh, he discovered particle physics long before the 20th, 20th century. <laughs> uh, I don't think he discovered this. I think this was, you know, a common heritage understanding of metaphysicians all, of all the Near East, right, uh, or from India to Greece. Um, uh, and there's a there's a kind of light metaphysics in Plato, and you know, uh, uh, and it's certainly in Plotinus. Um, we saw the thing last time about how this this notion of uh, reflection or copying as a way in which the higher can appear in the lower, and this this sort of thing, um, all of which is um, uh, put it this way, variations on light metaphysics. But I'm just pointing out the reason that light is the is the thing that is interest here is because it's the least material material thing. The thing which is being called darkness here is first just absence of light, but it's also sort of its own spiritual thing. And it's something like sin, and it's also something like matter. Um, uh, matter, spirit, uh, darkness, light, uh, chaos, order, all of these are lined up with one another as though they're the same distinction. Dark matter is the source of evil in the universe. <laughs> yes, sin, sin, sin is original dark matter, there you go. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Jim, more questions. Yeah, I was on page 214. Um, uh, fratricidal strife of darkness that inevitably leads to its first beholding of the light. And that is beholding in turn leads to the terrible union of its divided forces. Seems to be Manny's original and ingenious contribution to the doctrine. And then I just asked the question, uh, if that's the case, is he purposely being anthropomorphic? Because it seems like he's, I, I keep going back to Jungian ideas. And I know that's anachronistic, considering when this is written. Yes. I just like, he's definitely seems to be anthropomorphizing. And I don't know if he did that on purpose or- He's, cer he's certainly anthropomorphizing everything. Absolutely. He's also trying to import what he's going to see as sort of later um, spiritual or moral drama or difference into the origin stories, right? Um, just as you have a, you know, prime, a primeval Cain and Abel distinction in, in, uh, in the Bible, you'll have his, his, uh, um, what, what, what is it that the uh, spirits of darkness, what is the relationship they have to the light? The answer is uh, an envious covetousness, wanting to have it and you know, not wanting to be what they are, um, but without recognizing the superiority of the thing that they want, now want to be. 
they just want to have or conquer it, right? He, he, he says, uh, there's a one, one thing uh, he says, um, uh, when I see that something like this could exist, right? Uh, what is to me all of this uh, darkness I rule over? I will go. I will go over to that land and make war upon its king, right? Um, this is this is kind of you know uh, the reaction of the steppe nomads to discovering civilization, right? Uh, <laughs> you know what, what do I care about my goat herds when 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 there is you know uh, a, a Rome and a Babylon over there, right? I will go to Rome and Babylon and make war upon their kings, right? Um, uh, same thing with the Mongol in China, perhaps. But the 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 idea is that there's something about the uh, um, the the envious outsider who recognizes the superior superiority of the thing that he covets, but he doesn't want to reform and become like that thing, right? Um, he, he wants to rule over it. It's kind of a standing rebuke to him in his nature that this some this thing better than him exists, and and this is a a definite psychological reversal of what you get in sort of. Um, uh, uh, Greek Platonism, where you have this idea of the uh, of uh, the good attracting to itself and causing things by its power of attraction and so forth. Here, the uh, uh, the bad or the evil or the dark does does desire uh, does recognize the superiority and desires uh, the light, but it can't become it. The and this is the uh, as as um, uh, Jonas. Uh, uh, has a Greek philosopher you know, responding to all this, trying to find a Manny and finding him, you know, insufficiently charitable. He doesn't think that his God, you know, wants to go. Why doesn't his God want to go and reform the darkness, right? And uh, uh, Jonas correctly points out that the difference between them is not their conception of God, is that to Manichaeism there's a darkness that's real and eternal and can't be gotten rid of, right? So uh, that means that there's something unreformable about darkness or evil, right? Um, in that sense, it's not something to be saved. It's something to be uh, escaped, if not escaped and or uh, rendered powerless, right? Um, but uh, as, as Jonas points out, right, um, as he presents it, uh, the, the entire realm of light would have been completely content to remain the realm of light and the realm of darkness to remain the realm of darkness forever. It had no desire to go out and reform or enlighten the dark, right? The aggression all comes from the side of the evil principle. Um, which again is a contrast with the Valentinians, um, yeah. where it's some kind of decline from the high. Um, so, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons for the uh, uh, attractiveness of Manichaeanism at the time, and also for it sort of uh, be, being a perennial that keeps coming back. It seems to be uh, realistic about evil in a way that some more idealistic traditions are not, right? Um, and people find that uh, rings true in some sort of brass tack sense, not because they want it to be that way, but because they think it is that way. Yeah. So you're next. Sorry, I want to yes. just before Jim goes on to his next. I'm gonna, does someone else have another question they want to jump in on, or should we let just Jim keep going? I want to let Jim keep going, but if someone else has something they want to jump in on, Jim, you're keeping going. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> on page 226, uh, he says, this is a strangely naturalistic way of, uh, Jonas says, it's a strangely naturalistic way of extracting the light from its captors, a mythical theme which Gnostics before Manny had already embodied in their systems. I guess I, my question was, why does he think it's so strange? It's strange that it's, it's so naturalistic. <laughs> right. It, it, it's, like, it's like the way that you get spirit out of matter is you, you know, you know put it in a big taffy machine and pull it apart. Which is a very material way of acting upon it, right? It's not a very spiritual way of acting upon it. I mean, you might say the way to get spirit out of matter is to speak to the inspirited matter and enlighten it so that it reforms itself and becomes pure spirit, right? No, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna you know go in there with a kneading machine and separate out the particles of 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 good from the particles of dark, right? Yeah, yeah that's what he regards as strangely materialistic, right? Uh, yeah. So I was thinking about that. It's like at the end of the it, 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 they're trying to just get, keep. It's almost like a like a reduction. I keep thinking about, yeah, you re reduce the sauce, you keep boiling it until there's nothing left but the pungent reject, and the light thing, you keep- uh, Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, yes. until there's yes. like this particle left in there. That well, I mean, let's, let's, let's get to the actual, you know, visual myth. The actual visual myth is that, is that uh, uh, you almost reverse the direction in which light moves from the sun, right? You imagine that, that uh, uh, the sun is beaming down on everything on earth and it is making uh, the, 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 the pure light um, emit from the things on the earth and 
go up to the sphere of the moon where it is loaded for half a month and then passed off to the sun and the sun takes it to the sphere of the of the of the uh of the uh, uh equator to the to the uh horoscope whatever um and uh, uh that's some giant water wheel that carries it to the fixed stars so th there's this, there's this notion that light has to leave earth has to escape earth and be transported to the top of the heaven right in the in the sort of older gnostic speculations we saw thinking about you know how uh uh, the uh, uh, the Redeemer is going to penetrate all of the different spheres of the of the heavens in order to make it all the way down to Earth to uh, uh, create the rift from which uh, souls can escape up beyond the heaven, right? So there's there's the same notion of trying to get beyond the heaven in each. But here, uh, there's something about the actual machinery of the world which is already the escape route, right? It's already the railroad that can that can bring spirit to uh, to, to to beyond the heavens, um, and is doing so naturalistically all the time so that the amount of trapped uh, spirit in the world is continually decreasing, right? Um, yeah. uh, this is like, this is like uh, the Man Man Manian version of the principle of entropy, right? The, the, uh, uh, the, the, the good order is always escaping from the world, right? He doesn't see that as the world going downhill, he sees it as the, the, the order getting away, right? <laughs> um, but uh, the, the point is, it, it is a, it is a, um, uh, it's a it's a it's a visual image of the machinery of the cosmos as being involved in this mechanical transport version of salvation, something like that, um, which is, as he says, strangely naturalistic. Right, um, the whole thing started from a, uh, a a a light and spirit versus dark and matter distinction that would see uh, the material as the lower side of that, right. Um, but because it's all about the mixture and about undoing the mixture, you get this, you know, weird uh, materialist naturalism in the, of the imagery. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Which seems Sorry. to me like uh, I would say the Jungian part, even the psychological part, is he. If I were to put him in an ocean model, like he'd be high in openness, high in, uh, I guess, compassion, but more the openness. So he's going to create. He's trying to imagine the light as being less, has less boundaries. The light can, is so, uh, can travel so much easier than heavy matter. And, and they, so he equates. Yeah, it's uh, the, light the, only, the only reason that light is not freeing it, uh, freely moving itself to uh, its salvation is because it is trapped in matter, right? It's entirely the, 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 the matter matrix, which is, which is saying the same word twice. It's like Sahara Desert. Um, uh, uh, Matrix, matter, mother, same word, in case anyone didn't notice that. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, so, so, so the, the, um, uh, the idea is that it is only uh, uh, the material trapping spiritual uh, 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 human beings that is preventing their spirits from escaping, right? Um, and, and this is, uh, uh, man is the place where the most spirit is trapped, right? There's spirit in, everything, if there's order in anything. The way to think about this is that if there's any order in anything, there's some spirit in it, right? If there's any rationality in anything, there's some spirit in it. If there's any information in something, there's some spirit in it. That's the way of thinking about it. But the thing in which there's the most information and the most spirit is man, right? Um, but he's encased in a fleshy prison, right? And the question is, you know, can, can, the, uh, can, can the spirit in him uh, escape from the merely material uh, um, nature into which he is? in which he is currently trapped, right? That's the, that's the thing which Manny has in common with all the other Gnostics is the idea that the current situation of man is uh, a spirit trapped in a, uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a fallen matter from which it is trying to get away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay, so I'll keep going yep. until you tell me to stay. So, so page 227. Sorry, we had, a, we had a question from EJ. Yeah, I just had a question. So does he does he conclude that self control and uh, um, all of that is uh, kind of a way yes. to free the spirit from the body that is uh, yes. and, it is uh, it is it is self control and it's also a kind of asceticism uh, uh, because there is kind of uh, sorry asceticism it's asceticism meaning meaning um, uh, complete denial of desire complete conquering of desire. Um, quietism, having no desire at all in a kind of Buddhist way. Um, so so uh, the idea is that um, 
uh, it's not like uh, in Buddhism that all um, uh, particular desires have a kind of futility to them. It's that they all have a kind of um, um, moral wrong to them. Uh, every, every, every desire winds up uh, wronging the insold or the inspirited things around you, um, especially, uh, so he's, he's a vegetarian, right? Uh, because you don't want to hurt any insold thing. Um, uh, so th there's a, it, it's a very, um, a severe quietist denial of desire um, morality to refrain from as much as possible, um, including marriage, including children, including uh, 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 meat, right? So all of that sort of aesthetic morality is there as, as the, the means of being as little enslaved to matter as possible, so to speak, um, and as little, un as, as little unjust as possible, even though you're going to be forced to be unjust because you're embodied, um, uh, all, all the, if you, if you uh, uh, walk across the ground, you should make sure you don't step on any ants, right? It's this kind of asceticism. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. And by the way, he knows that that's something which most people cannot do. So this is the reason for the distinction between the, uh, uh, the kind of monastic, uh, uh, pure Mani, uh, Manichaean enlightened uh, who, are, who are going to live like monks in this ascetic way and the uh, supporters and fighters for it that only uh, defend it in the world, but uh, but don't abide by all that, the severity of all that. Joe? Uh, is uh, Jainism a successor to this uh, many idea? Don't think so, belief-wise. belief, belief wise. Um, I don't know as much about it as uh, I might, but I think the beliefs are different. There probably is some overlap. Uh, that aesthetic morality you find in lots of traditions, it's not specific to Manichaeism. Um, but it is the religion that a lot of, um, if I can put it this way, uh, quietist or um, uh, desire conquering uh, uh, understandings of morality or self control uh, issue in, whether that's, uh, uh, um, uh, what am I thinking of? There's a particular uh, Christian saint who's known for this, um, but uh, something of the desert. Anthony, Anthony of the Desert, right? Uh, St. Anthony, right? Uh, th there's, there's. Um, I'm just pointing out this tradition you get in, in, in lots of places, but um, Manny is certainly taking it to an extreme. Uh, it's not just uh, self-control for the sake of um, uh, some self-conquest or some vision that might result from it or something like that. It's uh, a belief that all of the uh, active desires that are the result of being embodied are specifically evil and the fewer of them you can have, the better. Or the fewer of them that you could have would lead you to wisdom and lead you to enlightenment and hence yes. you reduce those uh, things. That's what the content is. Right? Exactly, it's exactly. Because they reduce your power to be, get wisdom or enlightenment. Correct, correct. So that yes. the aesthetic practices are, are, are both morally commanded and they are a means to a means to enlightenment. They are also something which you are prompted to by what you understand in the course of enlightenment. Yes. Um, there's even there's even a uh, uh, a kind of uh, Buddhist and Indian notion in that um, that the uh, he, he says what will happen with the helpers and the answer is the helpers will have to be reincarnated until they end up as the pure. Um, they can only get off the the, the cycle of reincarnation by uh, achieving enlightenment in one of their lives. This is very similar to Buddhism. Oh, I, never, I thought only Buddhism and uh, Hinduism have that kind of philosophy, but yeah, that's good. Sure, to sure. You're right. There's, there's, it goes older than that. Buddhism itself is inheriting a bunch of things in that, in that regard. Um, all from the Vedic tradition originally, correct? Sorry? That's all from the Vedic tradition originally. Yes, much of it. I mean, the, 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 this, this notion that you can get off the wheel of reincarnation only by uh, achieving enlightenment is, I think, a bit later, but... Okay, um, great questions. Jim, you have more. Yes. So like any time if it gets to be too much, just let me know. Um, so on page 227, it says the image has become a device of the darkness, the copying not only of a kind, not, not only a kind of blasphemy in itself, but a devilish trick directed against the original. And then my note was, first I make a statement, then I ask a question. Yep. It's interesting that the image is used here counter to the Christian view that the image is more than a likeness. It's more, it's more a title than a likeness. Um, 
you know, the image in Christianity. So yeah, to understand what we're talking about, we're talking about right. um, the, yeah. the notion that man is uh, formed in the image of God is something which uh, right. to, to Jonas himself is one of the peaks of biblical, in his case, specifically uh, Jewish religion, right? The mm -hmm. biblical idea of man being created in the image of God, right? And his point is that in the Manichaean version of the Garden of Eden story, right? Uh, the creation of man is a device of the devil to keep the uh, to keep souls in, or spirit uh, ensnared in human bodies for generation after generation, right? Yes, um, right. My question so, was, was that a, del oh, go ahead. Well, the, the point is that that's, that's a, uh, that is definitely, as he says, a, a kind of blasphemous, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely directed against the original, right? Um, so Manny yeah, doesn't yeah. disagree that spiritual man is in some way uh, in the image of the highest God, in the sense that the highest God is spirit and man is spirit, and he needs to get back to that, right? That part is there, but the embodiment of man is here a device for uh, trapping spirit. Um, so instead of reflecting on the uh, uh, what is uh, high about a man as a version of embodied spirit, it's, uh, oh gosh, so spirit got embodied. That's the worst thing that can possibly happen to it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, so uh, that's the that's the change in accent, and that's why it's you know a trick of the darkness to get some spirit to be embodied when spirit shouldn't be embodied. Mm -hmm. Should spirit shouldn't be limited to body or by body. Um, Was that so, a um, a deliberate inversion uh, from the, an earlier Gnostic tradition or Zoroastrian? tradition or was that just it, i think it's a triple drip, uh, drip inversion of the original jewish tradition which might also be the christian tradition um but not from an earlier gnostic one the the, the gnostics okay. already had a little bit of this um but here, here's the like place the... here's the place where the valentines are different right? the, the valentines are, are christians right yes. they will say that uh um uh their creator god is trying to make man but man just lies there as a lump of clay um he's lifeless um but it is only after uh uh, Sophia, uh, the creator's mother, uh, tells him to uh, breathe spirit into him that he uh, that he begins to move. Right. So, in the Platonic tradition, soul is something like the principle of motion, but here it's spirit that makes matter come alive. Right. So, um, in that sense, uh, without spirit, no no real life, no real uh, uh, yeah, no no real life. So, um, uh, is it a good thing that the uh, that the that um, spirit is trapped that way? Um, not in this version because separation of the mixture is the whole point. In the Valentinian version, the best thing about man and the highest thing about man is the spirit that comes from uh, Sophia, not the embodied creation that comes from the creator God. Does that make sense? Yep. Yes. You actually answered a couple. Of, I was wondering about the Valentine. You already said it, so let's see. Yep. Um, so on. <clears throat> On 2.30, I asked the question, um, it was about the mission of the luminous Jesus, and then Jesus, uh, but uh, I'm going to mispronounce it, so I won't say it. Does, does he focus on Jesus as the pacifist due to the violent world in which he lives, and was he martyred for similar reasons? So was who martyred for similar reasons? Sorry. Um, Manny. So was, was Manny focused on Jesus as the pacifist due to the violent world in which he lived? Like, you know, like Machiavelli overreacted to... Um, the, I, the I don't think he's focused. He I don't think he's focused on Jesus as pacifist, particularly. I mean, to him, Jesus is a messenger of the uh, extra mundane God, very directly, right? So, uh, it's it's uh, is that is there a pacifism in that in the proclaiming of uh, the mon the extra mundane God? Yes, because the God beyond the world. Um, so that part. Does that have pacifist tendencies or ascetic tendencies? Yes, for all of Manny's own reasons. But uh, it's not pacifism in the political drama of the world that is moving Manny here. And as for why he, he himself is persecuted, it's because he's trying to bring you know, this Manichaean uh, Gnostic spiritual religion to a Persia that just wants to have a national tradition Persian uh, version of Zoroastrianism that they can trace back to their ancestors and say is our national thing, um, which they would never dream of trying to export to India or Babylon or Egypt or Greece because it's their specific natural national tradition to the Sasanids. Um, they're thinking it's almost political thing. Joe. 
Uh, I'd like to locate this in my mind. When did Mohammedism sweep over the uh, Iran Persian area? This is centuries later, like four centuries later. Okay, that helps me understand. Thank you. Yeah. So the persecution did happen through a, through a pope that was uh, living in France. Which one are you thinking of? Sorry, which one are you thinking of? I don't even answer a different question. Um, there were persecutions of the Manichaeans in the uh, pagan West under Diocletian and the uh, early Christian West under some of the successors of Constantine in the fourth century. Um, and that continues down to the time of Justinian uh, in the uh, Eastern Roman Empire. So um, uh, through that whole period, the, um, the different Roman emperors, uh, both East and West or just East um, are persecuting Manichaeanism specifically. Um, uh, that's being done less by popes than by emperors at the time. Um, uh, certainly, certainly later in like the uh, Middle Ages, if the Cathars in, uh, in the Albigensian Crusade are revived Manichaeans, uh, Manichaeans then there is a, a papal crusade, a sponsored crusade against them. That's way later, um, and and that depends upon what, identifying the Cathars as <clears throat> as Manichaeans. That would have been like, wasn't Thaddeus? Thaddeus made Christianity legal in 377 AD, I think. So it would have been after that, once it became the legal, like the 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 religion of Rome. When when when, when, when Christianity was. when Christianity is the legal religion of Rome, within you know 25 years, they're persecuting Manichaeans. <laughs> yeah. Um, which it isn't because they weren't persecuting Manichaeans before that they were. <laughs> it's, it's just they. Just you know, it up. Oh well, to some degree. I mean, I, it might have been worse under Diocletian, honestly, than it was under the uh, later Christian emperors, because it was pretty bad under Diocletian. By the way, it, there was also persecutions of the Manichaeans in China as late as 750 AD that also got very bad. Um, estimates of like half, half of the uh, Manichaean pure or their priests were, were, were killed in that persecution in 750 in China. Um, hmm. But let's just say it wasn't popular with all of the uh, empires in which it was living, with the exception of the ones in Central Asia that made it their state religion. Um, sorry, uh, other questions about any of that or should we go on to Jim's edition next? Yeah, next, thanks. Okay, Jim. Um, this is just, more of a thing I was pondering, and you can correct me on it if I just put a note at the end of it, um, practical conclusion section on page 231. Okay. Um, okay. Manny's um, ascetic morality, the practical conclusions from this cosmos teleological system are extremely clear cut, all of them amounting to a rigorous asceticism. And I put, it sounds a lot like modern vegan doctrine, in particular, the view of mankind as a cancer to be eradicated so that the pure beauty of nature can reclaim the earth. Sounds the difference like is, a little bit. The, the difference is that it's not pure beauty of nature, it's spirit that he wants that wants to be that he wants to free, and that includes spirit in men, right? Um, yeah. Uh, hu humanity for their spirit are among the most valuable things that exist, right? But their materiality is a curse on them, so to speak. So that's where the aestheticism comes from. Um, is there are there uh, do you find some similarities to that with you know uh, modern veganism? Maybe uh, uh, morally speaking. You also find it in people like Empedocles and, and Pythagoras in, in uh, earlier Greek stuff. Um, I don't think it's that specific. Um, I was wondering about the earlier Zoroastrian, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, it was like the light kind of by accident made the natural world, <laughs> but it's still beautiful and we're supposed to be apart from it so that we can achieve. So, so, you know, so in the original Zoroastrianism, the, the creation of the world is not a result of darkness. It's not, the, it's not, it's not, uh, down to darkness, the, the world is a, a good world that is you know, ruled over by Ahura Mazda. There are elements of uh, darkness in it that are ineradicable, so to speak. Um, there's certainly a notion of matter being the lower uh, in traditional Zoroastrianism, but uh, there's, none of, there's nothing like the Valentinian notion of the world having been created by an evil principle, which has here been replaced with something like, the world is created in order to separate light from darkness, separate the mixture, which has already occurred which is the sort of Manichaean version of this. So in that sense, there's some positive valuation of the creation of the world that at least has a positive purpose. 
in Manichaeanism that doesn't have in Valentinianism, but uh, uh, it's not anything like the original Zoroastrian story, which was much more clear cut. The world was much, much more a uh, fundamentally good place. So Hiro Mazda was going to win, right? It was a war between the, the, the children of light and the children of darkness, but the children of darkness were going down, right? That was the main story of Zoroastrianism, right? Um, does that help? Oh well, yeah, thanks. And that's it for that part, thankfully. <laughs> okay. Um, of course, we have a section too, but like I said, just. <laughs> yes, with the class was not just mine, but let, let's, let's finish up with things on Manichaeanism. Um, so um, there's, you know, weird stuff in this myth. Uh, there's this, uh, uh, there's the primal man, there's uh, the, um, uh, the, the messenger, there's the, uh, the uh, living spirits, something like this, spirit of life. Uh, there's, there's all these figures is what I'm trying to say, right? Between like typically five of them at a time, uh, between just uh, uh, the father of greatness, which is the word for the highest God, um, right? Uh, the primal man, the father of greatness, the friend of lights, the great architect, the living spirit, right? There, there's all of these um, uh, succession of these. Um, that are, um, they each have their role in the, in, in the drama, so to speak, but they're all the different agents of, of the father of greatness or of the, uh, or the highest principle. You don't get anything like the Valentinian, you know, um, embodied, uh, personalized spirits of each, uh, idea here, but you do have, um, you know, uh, each of these things being a, it's not quite a godlike spirit, something like a Holy Ghost-like spirit um, or figure. Um, Can you repeat that? Sorry, I, I'm, just, I'm just pointing out that there, all of these things have a role somewhat like the Holy Spirit has in Christianity as like a, uh, an instance of the Godhead or an agent of God or a third God that is not quite God the Father, but is somehow still God. Um, and there's just way more of them here, right? Um, he doesn't call them just angels. He doesn't call them just messengers. He doesn't call them, but they're all something like, um, uh, if not God, aspects of God. But there's a whole, you know, I'm just looking at page 222. There's a whole uh, slew of them, right? The primal man regained consciousness and he rests seven times a prayer to the father of greatness. The father heard his prayer and called forth as the second creation, the friend of lights. And the friend of lights called forth the great architect and the great architect called forth the living spirit, right? And the living spirit called forth his five sons. Right, so the, 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 the things which actually go out to confront the darkness are the five sons of the living spirit, right? Um, and there are four other things above that <laughs> before you get to the uh, uh, father of greatness. Um, if you count the primal man, a fifth. So what I'm trying to get at is just there's this, it's very elaborate. This is back to Chuck's point about uh, how elaborate these things get. Um, does I, did anyone else notice the, uh, the thing on 220 about uh, his maiden, which we also get on 221. Anyone knows what that's about? What that's about? What does he mean by his maiden? Jim has an answer. I'm going to totally make an idiot on myself. I thought it was a reference to Sophia. Not quite. In Valentinians, it would be Sophia, but here, each, each, each soul has their maiden, which is something like their. Uh, it's, it's uh, their, their guardian angel uh, is the term that we would use these days. The, the, the original of the guardian angel, angels in Zoroastrianism were something like the Valkyrie of Norse myths. They were the, the, the Amisha. They were the, the, these, these uh, uh, spirits of light that were the uh, pers personal protectors of the soulfulness or something like that, or conscience of, of each person, right? They were a, a heavenly spirit guardian Right, and that was that was their maiden, as that was just the name for it. Um, uh, but these are these are Valkyrie-like figures in Zoroastrianism. If I can get it that way, if I can put it that way. Um, and we we saw before back in the we were talking about the hymn of the pearl. There was this notion of this um, uh, self or spirit mirrored in heaven. Right. This is an earlier version of the same idea, basically. Um, that your, that your guardian angel is something like your good conscience sitting on your left shoulder telling you the right thing to do. Um, you know, 
all of that, th those are those are modern popular versions of of, of this same the same idea. Um, anyway, just that's just one of these places where if you don't know the tradition he's referring to, it could be very obscure. Um, what he meant by the maiden there. Um, okay. Uh, uh, one of the reasons I'm bringing up all these things is these things about both asceticism and about the conscience and the uh, uh, heavenly version of yourself or something like that um, are to me the kind of substitute in any of this for a notion of virtue, right? Jo uh, Jonas is in, in chapter 12 is gonna tell us, uh, or 11, uh, is gonna tell us that they, there really isn't a notion of, of virtue in Gnosticism. This is a criticism of them from the uh, Hellenic Greek perspective that Plotinus makes, for example. Um, they're not talking, they never talk about virtue, he says. Um, and we can go to the reasons why, but the substitute for it is something more this, more like this religious piety and concern for the uh, eternal self in heaven um, that has replaced concern with anything like um, worldly virtue in the sense of excellence in the sense of being good at things, right? Being good at doing things has been replaced with this concern with the kind of uh, purity of the soul for its sake, for the sake of heaven. Um, Jim, you mentioned several of the uh, psychology traits. The other one I want to mention here that it, um, Jonas does a little bit to suppress is disgust, because there's definitely plenty of disgust uh, being brought out here. He wants he wants things related to uh, uh, embodiment to to uh, sound and feel disgusting. Um, you find a little bit of this, by the way, earlier in Empedocles too. He talks about how uh, I didn't know what I was doing and I sinned with my teeth. He means he he ate he ate flesh. Um, but uh, anyway, there's, there's definitely a, a, an attempt to invoke a disgust response uh, in, in this. Um, talking about personality Particular traits. With the way that humans are created as a response to the original light creation by Adam and Eve, turning yes. Them into, yeah. Yes. Um, the, 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 creation, the creation of the, uh, of the, of the uh, Adam and Eve is, is uh, as offspring of devils, right? In, in, in devilish ways. Um, but even, even, the, even the plants have uh, something low about their origin. Um, but there's disgust response and all of that. Anyway, uh, all right. So we've talked about different varieties of Gnosticism, we've gone through Manichaeanism. Um, uh, a couple things that are notable. It's very different from the Valentinians in, in, in the way it plugs into all of the, especially Persian, but also Babylonian and other, uh, you know, Buddhist, etc., other um, mythos around it. It's it's got this highly syncretic way. It's not trying to um, follow a single path from maybe um, uh, Plotinus or some other kind of version of metaphysical imagination about the nature of the Godhead or something like that. It's instead putting together these myth traditions from all around, but with the strongest influence from the Persian or Zoroastrian, um, and it has this interesting uh, twist on the valuation of embodied person versus cosmos. It has this very elaborate physical separation of the light um, notion of ongoing salvation. But all of that is still in the service of this same Gnostic view that um, the fundamental thing about human condition is that uh, uh, human beings are spirits trapped in matter um, and their purified escape from matter is their salvation. Um, so that Gnostic um, common thing is still there. The origin stories of it are different, but the reality uh, uh, that it presents is the same. Okay, so that's just summing up Manichaeanism. Um, any questions on that before we go on to the, the next chapter? We got the detailed questions, we, people have, mega questions about it, uh, meta questions about it. Apparently not. All right, so the next one is the idea of the cosmos, man's place in it. This is where he's turning to this kind of Greek reaction, um, which is Greek reaction and modern reaction is sort of what the rest of the book is gonna be about. And um, uh, in the case of the Greek reaction, the big thing is the complete change in the, in the valuation of cosmos. Cosmos was like a 
principle of order. It wasn't ju didn't just mean the world, didn't just mean the all. It meant something like the order, the beautiful order of the, of, of the world, right? There's a notion of, uh, of beauty, greatness, order, fitness, properness. Um, uh, this is what also gave us, you know, teleology, right? The in in the, in sort of the Greek conception of the world. Um, so that the um, the order of the world was a model for man. Uh, his ability to understand that order was the highest thing in him, and it was a a model of how to conduct oneself, how the universe conducts itself, so to speak. Um, and the Gnostics have completely upset that, completely blown that away, right? The fact that the universe does things a certain way is a reason for suspecting that way of doing things, not a reason for emulating that way of doing things. The fact that something works in the world proves that it is worldly, not that it is good. Um, I put it to you that they're underlying this, there is a, um, besides all the sort of um, transcendent God notions behind it, there's a fundamental um, reversal of the valuation of something like power or rule going on here power or rule are seen as being oppressive, uh, tyrannical, um, morally tainted, as opposed to being something to uh, strive for or emulate. Uh, there is a highest God that is in some sense the overall cosmic ruling principle behind the world uh, of which that, isn't, that wouldn't apply to, but um, he didn't make the world. Uh, the world doesn't obey him. The whole world is under the sway of the evil one and being worldly and succeeding in the world are signs of fallenness. Um, and that is in a way, if not the first, the, the, the most is probably the second most stri uh, strident or, stri or striking thing about Gnosticism. The other would be the sense of alienness in the world it would be even more fundamental here. But um, uh, the world has lot, uh, the world in previous traditions have told you uh, the things which are needed to succeed in the world. And previous traditions have all been about fitting into the world and understanding one's place in it in order to succeed in it, right? And Gnosticism is throwing all that out by saying uh, to succeed in this world is not a good thing, right? It, that's uh, it's the definition of corruption or fallenness. So just first reactions to any of that. Joe. Well, that sounds to me like a very early version or at least sounds like a version of the uh... Hate the rich because you're not a successful person. Uh, so you should turn in and purify your soul. And uh, all, anybody that uh, has become at all successful, uh, you know, the so-called rich uh, are, are all going to hell. There's certainly some of that. It is easier to, or rich man to pass through. I have a needle into the king of heaven is the biblical version of that. Um, but I don't think it's just rich. I think it's uh, <clears throat> worldly power, especially. Right, successful at all, it's successful well, in any way. But it's not. It's not successful just successful in power. It's not just successful. Right, power and success are being just just uh, separated from one another here. Right, the 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 images of power that people have in this period is you know Diocletian, right, a Roman emperor who you know rules from the uh, from Scotland to the Euphrates, right, and what is his characteristic action? Um, to force everyone to sacrifice to him, to show that they are loyal to the emperor, and to punish them as uh, as guilty of treason if they worship any other god. Right. Um, so that that's that's the image of what power looks like in the world. Um, it's yeah. not savory um, to them. So go ahead, Julia. That's what I wanted to add. Like the definition of success differ, changed from time to time and from religion to religion, I guess. And in this one, success meant uh, giving away all that wealth and worldly pleasures, so-called worldly pleasures, right? Yes, and that's what you get in both Buddhism and Christianity as, you know, uh, uh, go sell all you have, give to the poor, come and follow me, right? That, or the, uh, uh, the, the, the prince who lays down his riches to go out and, and, and be a monk, right? That, that's the tradition you see in, in both of them. I'm saying that there's also something that that's reacting to, right? It's reacting to the fact that what, what counted as political success, worldly success in the world was seen as having something um, tyrannical and evil about it. It was, it was actively persecuting uh, the, the innocently spiritual, right? As being insufficiently committed to something like its political goals. Who cares about its political goals? There's no opposition to Diocletian from Scotland to the Euphrates, right? But he's still burning people to death because he doesn't like what they what they think, right? It, th there's a very unsavory character that the world is taking on. Is what I'm trying to say, right? Um, uh, 
and there's a question of how that how much that spreads. Um, the 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 Stoics and the um, uh, and the uh, Plotinian Neoplatonists, right, uh, don't think any of that is a reason for uh, losing one's loyalty to the cosmos as opposed to a polity, right? And and Jonas points out that the uh, it's almost a a a settling and a fallback that now these uh, um, uh, secular philosophical views in the uh, in the Roman Empire are all about being a good citizen of the cosmos. Not worried about being a good citizen of Rome anymore. Nobody thinks that it's possible to be a good citizen in Rome at, by this time, right? You can't be a good citizen in a bad city, right? Something like that. Um, but but uh, it is possible to be a good citizen of the cosmos, they think, right? And and that's the what is what has come to be the ideal of the kind of secular philosophical culture of the Roman and Hellenic world um, in which all this, uh, all these religious um, counter movements are bubbling up. But Jonas is right to point out that that's already settling. It's already, um, and, and also that there's something implausible about it, right? Uh, he, he points out that, you know, if, if, you're, if you're seeing your, uh, uh, the city as something you're loyal to because you can affect it, you actually can affect the city. You can't actually affect the cosmos, right? Not, not anything like a stoic uh, material, you know, uh, uh, a divine providence cosmos at any rate. Um, you, you might be able to uh, matter in the cosmic scheme of things in a, in a war between the sons of uh, light and the sons of darkness, uh, a la Zoroastrianism, right? In that sense, has, your actions have some cosmic significance, but um, do a stoic philosopher, do his actions have, ever have cosmic significance? No, the cosmos doesn't care about him. Doesn't need to care about him. It, it is at most a, a um, uh, something he can look up to and emulate. Why does he want to emulate it? Because he thinks that it's uh, a a, um, a standard of order, power, and you know largeness, something like that. Okay, and order and power and largeness matter because something like because power is good, <laughs> something like that. Um, there's no actual reason given, right? Um, and the the typical um, uh, dutiful Stoic um, is having very little effect on the on the world, right? And this is why you get these, this kind of, this is a thing Chesterton calls the resignation of the, of the great men of the Stoics, right? It's not immortals to deserve success, but sorry, to obtain success, but we'll do more, we'll deserve it, right? They fall back to deserving success, right? They want to be so moral and upstanding and good citizens of the cosmos that they deserve success, but they don't actually expect to attain it, right? So there's that spirit of, resign of, of resignation and settling, which is there in the in the background philosophies of the time that, that um, both Christianity and Gnosticism are kind of reacting to. Um, and compared to that, the, the Gnostics are saying, no, no, the, the, the cosmos that you're considering an ensouled being, if it's an ensouled being, it's not a good ensouled being, right? If it, if it has you know, power over man, it's not using that power for spiritual thing, for, for spiritual uh, uh, ends or reasons, right? So there's a sense in which the, the cosmos becomes alien in the sense that the more spiritual its power is, um, the more oppressive that is. It's not th that, this, that the universe is seen as, a, as a, uh, a cold, impersonal, unalive place, like you maybe get in modern times, um, but that uh, any spirituality has, it has, is sort of actively negative in the sense that it's, uh, it's just making uh, life harder for the spiritual, something like that. Um, now, the part of, you, of what you said, Joe, that I am going to agree with is there is a spirit of resentment in that, no question. Uh, this is something that uh, um, uh, Jonas will pick up on when he you know, compares some of these things to modern nihilism. But I don't think it's simply nihilistic because, um, or pessimistic, because they do think that there is an out, so to speak. They are looking for, for uh, something like a, uh, a, a personal salvation because they don't expect any uh, public one, um, if that makes sense. Um, but the, this is something which the, um, the, the folks around them, he, he cites Plotinus, uh, Chrysippus, uh, the Stoics, uh, Aristotle, right? You know, it's not even they can't understand it. They, they see it as blasphemy, right? It's, 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 it's plain revolt against what's, uh, what's good and right um, because they're not trying to, they're not trying to, uh, use what they have in common with the, with the world to understand the world. They're trying to use it to um, denigrate the world or escape from it, something like that. Um, reactions to any of this aspect of it through his going through in this chapter? Yeah, I, I definitely did. Um, I, well, I wrote two notes, so I'm concise. 
Um, at this point, at this point, it seems the Manichaean Gnosticism played the role of the darkness against classical Christianity and Greek thought, almost casting itself as the necessary adversary of the light, always destined to be consumed by it. And then also on the part of, uh, about this. Sorry, sorry. This, Before you go into the also, I didn't, I didn't quite understand that. So, so, so again, it seems like. Manichaean, it, it casts itself as the role of the darkness against the light of Christianity. I, I, I'm trying, and, and, I'm trying, trying to wait, I'm gonna slow, slow, slow down, right? Because I mean, it doesn't think of itself as being on the side of darkness, right? Obviously, it thinks well, of itself as being on the side of light. Unconscious. Exactly. I think that's what I was going to get you but, next. Is it but, but this like, is, but, oh, but, but, but the point is that that flipping is, is, is there. I mean, it, it sees itself as being on the world of light and it sees, it sees the, uh, the things which the Greek world extolled as being the darkness. Right. right. And why? Because because they're worldly, because they're um, they're trying to read off all their uh, lessons about what you should do based upon what works to sort of get ahead in the world, so to speak. That's their notion of what virtue is. Virtue as excellence is, you know, getting along well in the world in the sense of, you know, uh, uh, manipulating the world in power uh, well, something like that. And, and that's that's what. Um, uh, the Manichaeans and after the Christians to some degree are reacting to as um, uh, a fallen result of perverse standards, right? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I just thought of Nietzsche when he said that sometimes writers reveal, reveal more about themselves than the thing they think they're talking about by what they write. So maybe yes. I was over psychoanalyzing it. No, I, I, I understand you. I mean, and certainly uh, uh, Nietzsche would see this as a spirit of resentment, you know, going, uh, uh, going on, right? But I don't yeah. think that that is casting themselves as the dark because the dark doesn't have the same role in the things that they're arguing against, right? The dark doesn't have the role of, of uh, that you, uh, in Plotinus or in uh, Aristotle that it has in Zoroastrianism or Manichaeanism or even Christianity, right? Um, there isn't the same place of dark, right? Uh, the notion of evil you get in all those different traditions is something more just like um, uh, absence of good, um, uh, weakness, fallenness, concern with the ephemeral, something like that. All of which can be um, interpreted as one another form of um, uh, ignorance or stupidity or not being right about things, right? Um, which is different from anything like active malignancy, right? Th there isn't the same stark notion of anything like spiritual evil in uh, Plotinus or Aristotle that there is in, you know, Manny or the Bible even. Right, it's definitely a meta view, not a specific one, because he doesn't want what the light has. Like, he like if he was a darkness, he doesn't want what the, the Chris Christianity and uh, <laughs> classical Greek thinking has. He thinks that's He's absolutely rejecting it. I was just looking at it like from, I guess- I think, I think that from the stem, I think he might want something that, that Christianity has more than he wants something that classical philosophy has. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it would be fair to say that there's an element of um, envious emulation in Manichaeanism vis-a-vis -vis Christianity, uh, mm -hmm. or for that matter, uh, 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 Zoroastrianism or Buddhism, right? Um, uh, you know, it wants to supplant those things because it admires those things, but it isn't those things. Yeah, um, there's another part of this that was fascinating to me is when I was reading chapter nine, in particular, going through the, uh, the myths and, and reading it, it was my mind and my emotions were in a completely different space. I felt so, I guess, intoxicated a bit by the, the, the narrative and the use of imagery. And it was, a, it was uh, I, I, hard to explain and put into words how I felt like I was on a little, like, I don't know, trip or something. But yes, then when you it's get trippy. next yes. chapter, all of a sudden I'm like, ding. And it's like this real cold, not cold, but like we're back to the real world now. And the way that um, Jonas talks about it was sort of like, okay, I'm, I'm out of the dream world and back into let's think about things. And, and to me, I'm being uh, syncretistic, syncretistic because there's parts I loved about mm -hmm. the Manichaean Gnostic um, in, in particular, some individualism, individualism I liked, and also this, this is this it? Is all there is? Is this the, 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 the so there's a lot I liked, and there's parts, I, it's a struggle because I loved yep. how I felt yep. reading chapter nine. 
Right, but when you get to that chapter ten, you also feel like you know when when, when Plotinus and 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 the, and the Stoics and the uh, Aristotelians are talking, you feel like these are you know rational doctrines rationally defended mostly, right? Yeah. Um, there are some aspects of it though which aren't simply rational doctrines rationally uh, uh, defended. Certainly, from our point of view, I mean, I say our point of view, I mean, as moderns, right? Uh, and Jonas is right about that that we we don't expect to feel more community with the uh, uh, world spirit than with uh, 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 human beings who lack excellence. We see more in common with other human beings who lack excellence than we do with anything like, you know, the spheres or the world soul, right? Something like that. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, Plotinus and Aristotle are the other way. They think that, you know, a rational person has more in common with the spheres than he does with an irrational person, right? That's a completely alien notion to us, right? Uh, we're, we're we expect there to be a, a commonality of nature uh, with, with other people that we don't expect there to be with anything like brute nature, um, brute, brute uh, natural world. Um, because to us, there's a stark difference between something like a human living spirit and something like, you know, a planet, right? We don't, we, we expect nothing from the planet, right? Um, so, so uh, uh, and from that point of view, it's the, it's the Aristotelians and Plotinians that seem like they're engaged in wild magical thinking because they think Jupiter is alive, right? And I don't mean Jupiter the god, I mean Jupiter the planet. Um, and you know that's what seems weird, wild and weird to us. <laughs> um, uh, but I, 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 I like your point about the, you know, just reactions of different, feeling like you're in a different moral atmosphere when you go from nine to 10, right? He, he's plopping you back into what would the classical, um, philosophers have have made of this thing and what did they make of this thing as it was going on right around them right and the answer is there were things which they you know saw in common with their own notions of divinity right in Plotinus and uh, Valentinianism say but uh, morally they're not on the same page at all right because fundamentally the Stoics and the and the Neoplatonists don't feel alien alien in the world they feel at home in the world um, they think the more they understand the world, the more at home they are in it. They don't feel alien in it. They feel like it's their world, right? Um, what is the, uh, what is the uh, 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 this place where Chester talks about the, the, uh, the cosmic patriot, my cosmos, right or wrong, right? <laughs> I mean, the, 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 uh, uh, there's an element of that in the Stoics, right? They're, you know, my cosmos, right or wrong people. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I, I, I think that, that moral difference between the two chapters is very clear. Um, and it's not just because one is, you know, wilder mm -hmm. or more out there because, you know, Jupiter being alive is more out there for us than, you know, well, maybe some of the things in Manichaeans were also weird, but <laughs> um, uh, you get the point. Uh, Joe, do you have a reaction to some of that? I saw you reacting. Maybe no, not. I wasn't really reacting. Uh, I was uh, amused at some things, but uh, not uh, thinking deeper about contraries. Fair enough. Uh, um, if uh, before ahead, we entirely leave Manichaeism behind for chapter 10, uh, am I correct that this is the first major tradition that uh, looks askew at uh, sexual reproduction? It's not the first. There are others. What other one would have looked to? Uh, I mean, there were any. There, there were, there were um, uh, ascetic sects among some of the uh, uh, Jewish sects around the time of the Essenes, for example. Um, uh, where else? Um, uh, there were certainly some elements of early Christianity that were like that. Um, uh, some have become eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Um, you know, the, so uh, I think it's fair to say that that attitude uh, does um, get a massive boost from the both Gnostic and Christian transcendental personal religion of salvation stuff, right? Um, uh, it's a fair question, but I mean, I, I think I, uh, I'm trying to think if there's another precedent before that. Not thinking of one, but you certainly. Uh, it's, I think there are elements of it in in uh, in early Christianity uh, and in 
maybe in some elements of uh, um, heretical Judaism around the same time. I'm thinking Essenes in particular, but. Um, okay. Uh, sidereal piety, destiny in the stars, right? Um, so uh, uh, some of this is quite alien in the sense that, you know, we tend to not be astrologers today, but uh, we do believe in something like um, uh, scientific necessity, if not in uh, uh, an astrological version of it, so to speak. Um, that's the closest thing here. They're, they're thinking about uh, the problem of necessity and freedom, something like that. And the, uh, the point that Jonas is making in this section is that um, the thing which uh, passes for necessity then, cosmic necessity then, is both the divine providence of the stoa and it's the um, astrological determinism and it's uh, uh, anything like a, a physical determinism. All those things together are part of a kind of, um, put it this way, cosmic materialism of the secular world of the time, which is probably most prominent in the Stoa. Um, and whatever happens was fated to happen and is good because it was fated to happen by a good cosmos. And the only thing that you, you are uh, expected to do is to learn to accept it as if not good for you, at least good for the whole of which you are a part, something like that. Um, and that's something which is there as a, as a principle of both understanding man's place in the world or the degree or lack thereof of his power, um, as well as you know, what passed for piety or passed for a version of quietism as a uh, love of fate, something like that um, in, the, in, in the Stoics especially. But in these other, um, I come to this way, more rational and secularist um, uh, philosophical traditions of the time. And against all of that, Gnosticism is a revolt, right? Gnosticism is trying to say, all of that is true only of the worldly and the soulful, but not of the spiritual. The spiritual realm is supposed to be entirely above anything like a natural necessity. Um, so uh, uh, I think that is something which um, has an immense afterlife and influence. I think it's also somewhat, uh, it's there in Christianity, although more paradoxically in some parts of Christianity, um, but this uh, um, uh, spiritual freedom, uh, rejecting anything like a, a cosmic fate, um, is one of the I think this way, one of the key notes of Gnosticism, um, and it's one of its strongest contrasts with the secular beliefs of the contemporary ancient world. Um, anyone else have thoughts on on all of that? BJ? Is that the yeah. is that the next chapter that we could, we were planning to discuss next uh, during the next session? Uh, this is the next. Uh, yeah, this is this is part of this one. What we're expecting to read for next time is uh, the rest of the books, so chapters eleven through thirteen, uh, which is on um, virtue. Some of the uh, some discussion of the more recent finds about Gnosticism in terms of um, what they've. Um, uh, unearthed since the time he first wrote the book uh, of you know, original texts and so forth. And then his epilogue, Gnosticism, Nihilism, and Existentialism, where he tries to tie some of this together with his own philosophical concerns and, and these days, kind of uh, as opposed to ancient history. Um, that's what we're going to be doing next time. Is that what your question was? Yeah. So I just wanted to check what was the next uh, book that you guys are planning to read? Oh, I think I missed most it. of this, so I'm just going to. Got it. The next, book we're, planning, the next book we're planning to read is this. Um, I'll put a link up for it at the end of this session, but it's uh, a book by a contemporary, it's a secondary source, but it's about negative theology, tradition of negative theology, which is the idea of understanding God by what you can't know about him or what isn't true about him, right? God is not X, God is not Y, God is not Z. And from that, you figure out something, right? So, and this is tracing this idea from early Greek philosophy down to uh, John Scotus um, in, uh, at the ninth century or so, eighth century in uh, France. Um, so it's uh, about half about the pre-Christian and half about the Christian version of this notion of negative theology. So anyway, the, the, the author is this dear woman, uh, Deirdre Carabine, um, and we'll 
we'll be reading this next, probably starting first session. This will probably be um, middle to second half of September, because we need one more session on this, and we'll probably have a three week break before this one. Um, and I don't know how many sessions we'll do on this, but it'll probably be, you know, four or so, something like that. She's specifically trying to jump off from Mars Hill, where Paul talks to the Greeks at Mars Hill and says, oh, the unknown God, let's talk about that. Is that yes. Jump? Yep. So, 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 so yes, but this is also just, it's her, uh, it's the, uh, the notion of a, uh, uh, a trans mundane God and the notion of a God that cannot be known. And, and some of that is definitely takes off in Christianity, but it's also there in uh, some philosophy in Plato, Neo-Pythagoreans, Middle Platonism, uh, the Hermetics, um, uh, Plotinus, and later Neoplatonics uh, uh, Neo like um, Proclus. So that, that's the first half of the book is just all that um, uh, down to Neoplatonic, but roughly uh, not even, Plato, Plato to Proclus, um, which is uh, of which two thirds of that is before Christianity and about a third of it is after Christianity. And then uh, on, the, on the Christian side, it's people like, um, well, first Philo of Alexandria, who's not Christian, he's Jewish. Um, but as the uh, background to this, Gregory of Nyssa, uh, Eastern Church Father, uh, Augustine, the Pseudo Dionysus, which is probably the place where this got most elaborate. And then John Scottus Eurigena, who's a, a translator of Dion Pseudo Dionysus into the Latin West in like the eighth century, ninth century uh, France. He's a uh, Irish monk living in France, translating the uh, Greek uh, philosophy of the church of the um, Greek fathers into Latins who haven't heard anything about this stuff um, and get, we're getting all of their theology from Augustine. So that, that's, the, that's the scope of it um, and the, in terms of what it covers. But the topic is what is knowable or unknowable about God, basically. Ineffable, unnameable, unknowable, right? Uh, Pseudo Dionysus has the famous statement that the, of all the names of God, the one which is least misleading is nothing because nothing can be known about him. Um, something like that, but that, that's the that's the tradition that we wanted to go through because it's come up several times in, in our discussions. It's a place where some of these um, Neoplatonic ideas, which we saw some of in Gnosticism, uh, definitely go into mainline Christianity. Um, not particularly Gnostic from the Gnostic sources, but from the Neoplatonic sources. Um, and so that's uh, in part. Jack asked, you know, what is the Neoplatonism I should read that actually influenced the Church Fathers and Church traditions? The answer is this stuff, right? About half and in, I, half out. Okay, interesting. And uh, there's this belief that there are certain uh, sects of people or certain religions that don't even want to take the name of God because they believe yes. they're not worthy to take the name of God. So they rather write it down than say it out loud. So some concepts yes. of that. Yes, and also who uh, who thinks that the the. Uh, it's better to use a name which is a euphemism than the than an actual name, and that all the euphemistic names are only you know uh, are yeah, only yeah. things you are somewhat negative, right? Um, yeah. So th there's th there's a whole tradition, a philosophical and uh, theological tradition of uh, names of God and what they do and don't tell you uh, involved in this too. Um, yeah. Right. Thank you so much. I appreciate sure. it. I gotta leave. Thanks for letting me in. Yeah, no problem. A uh, uh, great question. So uh, please do come back and uh, hope to see you for the next one. Thanks. Okay. Uh, we wanted to, uh, yeah, we were on, I was on cosmic necessity. Um, anyone else have reactions to the cosmic necessity and overthrowing the cosmic necessity idea? The Brotherhood of Men and the Stars. I wanted to talk about a couple of things which are funny about this because uh, I notice that when he's quoting all of these different uh, um, uh, classical philosophers who uh, are going to have these notions about the um, uh, the ordered perfection of the visible cosmos and its order or, and its necessity, um, he conspicuously doesn't cite Platonists other than Plotinus, right? And there's a reason for this, which is that the the Platonists are less are less uh, enamored of the uh, of the visible world than say the Stoics or the Aristotelians. Why is this? Because um, there's, there's a notion in which um, 
the intelligible world is more important and more perfect. And there's something uh, less than perfect about the visible world or the world in time to the Platonists uh, that you don't get in the other traditions. You don't get in the Aristotelians and the Stoics, for example, um, which is some, which is a, in a way, a point of contact with the with the Gnostic or Christian traditions. There's a the, the noumenal realm being more important than the phenomenal realm, something like that, um, is something that the that the uh, a Platonist like Proclus or Iambelicus or something like that will have more in common with the Stoics and not so uh, with the uh, Gnostics and Christians than either would with the Stoics or the Peripatetics. Say, um, I don't know if anyone else noticed that, but um, he he does give. Uh, Plotinus's reaction as the as the one place where he's uh, uh, got a Platonist he can cite, so to speak. There's still a fundamental difference, though. Even the Platonists who think that way think that the that the world is good, or the world is attracted to good. The world is ordered by good, right? Uh, <clears throat> good as a as a final cause is ordering the world, right? Um, now, some of the Gnostics and Christians would agree with that if it's understood in a uh, large enough way. It's just world to them is a much smaller thing than the grand scheme of things. World or cosmos means visible world or visible cosmos in time. And that to them is just a piece of the divine drama, so to speak. Um, uh, so any place where they're gonna put in anything like a highest good causality is gonna be in the whole divine drama and not in the world. Um, okay. Uh, Jim, I'm going to ask you if you have any other particular questions we haven't gotten to on chapter 10. Yes, I had a question. Sure. Was there any, this is what I wrote. Was there, I'm sorry, I was eating a candy bar, not a protein bar. Um, was there any connection to the development of the scholastics as an answer to Gnosticism? Did they regard finding unity with Greek thought metaphysically as a partner with Christian theology to form a lethal alliance against the Gnostic attack? Quote unquote. Like my quote, but you it's know, a fine it question. But I mean, in, in, in later scholasticism, it's all so much afterwards that they, anything like a Gnostic threat is gone, right? Um, uh, uh, were there places where there was uh, a you know common front sort of thing uh, uh, in some of the church fathers who were actually fighting the Gnostics? That would be in people like Clement of Alexandria or Oregon, right? And there, I think the answer is yes, to the extent that they were aligning with Platonism specifically, um, but not in these other uh, these other traditions. Um, you certainly get some of that in Augustine, um, uh, where he, when Augustine rejects Manichaeanism, it's because he wants uh, uh, to understand evil as only the privation of good, because he wants a, a Platonic good principle to be, you know, the uh, the core of things. The result is he has a he, he needs to have an entirely negative conception of evil, right? That's the thing which can get him out of Manichaeanism. So in that sense, he reaches for platonic uh, ammunition to differentiate Christianity from Manichaeanism. So those are the places where I would see things like that going on, but all that's way earlier than we normally think of a scholasticism in the sense of the um, high middle ages. Yeah, thing. Yeah, and the end of the first millennium they start, right? Or I didn't think beginning of the second, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. yeah. Well, Sorry. yeah. Well, and, first, and and some is late first, um, uh, and he's, I guess he's a scholastic. He's he's more some of the scholastics are actually looking back up. When I think of high scholasticism, I think of the age of um, uh, Bonaventura and uh, Alfred the Great and uh, Aquinas and uh, uh, Duns Scotus and, and all that. And that's um, well after and um, It's a uh, okay. It's after Aristotle comes in that it really takes off, right? It's after they, um, um, not just Plato, but Aristotle uh, is, a, is, a, is a live issue. Um, and the relation to what Islam has found in the Middle Ages is also a live issue. They're, they're reading things that go back to uh, the Neoplatonists, um, like the Book of Causes. They, they, they read a book called the Book of Causes. What is the Book of Causes? It's, it's something which is, you know, uh, the scholastics are making much of. It's not Gnostic, but it's, uh, um, they think of it as something which has been passed down to them from the um, uh, uh, Islamic Platonists of the Middle Ages, right? But it's mostly a, a Arabic paraphrase of Pofiri, who is a commentator on, he was the editor of Plotinus's works, Pofiri, right? So Plotinian Neoplatonism, 
you know, he has a couple of generations after him, you know, or generation after him, uh, Pofri is his sort of literary executor. And he writes this uh, uh, explanation of um, uh, how causation works according to Neoplatonism. And then some uh, Arabic uh, uh, author of the time of Al-Kindi uh, translates this into Arabic and summarizes it and paraphrases it in various places. And this gets passed back to the scholastics in the Latin West um, hundreds of years later as the book of causes. And it's you know the standard, the first text in metaphysics, right? That you have to read is the book of causes. You have to read Aristotle's metaphysics, you have to read the book of causes, right? Um, and you know, every uh, everyone will write a commentary on the book of causes as part of their sort of standard metaphysical explanation of things. Mm. So that, that's a place where this, there's this kind of crossover, but did they know at the time that it was paraphrases from Pophory? No, <laughs> they didn't have the Pophory and they couldn't, you know, they didn't, you know, use through the translation enough to know that that's what it was, but that is what it was. So there's all, there are these places where um, uh, uh, classical age Neoplatonism influences tradition, not just through the Greek church fathers um, or something like that, but also, you know, through the back door into scholasticism directly. Um, Okay, uh, I was touched off by your mention of scholasticism, the question. <laughs> so uh, what else? I wanna get people's reactions to this um, cosmic difference. I mean, I, I think Jim talked on it a little bit, but um, uh, in the alien in the world versus uh, uh, learn to be at home in the world uh, outlooks that we see at, here contrasted in chapter 10, which of the two is more congenial? Which of the two is more, makes more sense to us now? <clears throat> I keep talking, so I'm afraid. I'm you, can, you, can, you can talk. I'm sure, I'm sure Craig one. has an answer too, but uh, your, your answer <laughs> would be a, of interest. It's a tough one because if I take it strictly from a, So there's a Christian perspective about aliens and we're aliens, this isn't our home, blah, blah, blah. And then there's a part that's the kingdom of God is within you. You're supposed to make a nice difference here, not wait for something later. You know, we transform the world through, you know, uh, having a spirit living within us. Like if you take it from a Christian theological perspective, personally, I feel pretty at home in the world. Um, I, I I'm a little hedonistic, I guess. I like drinking and eating and doing things and having fun. I, I enjoy it. Um, but I think you don't think you're asking me personally. Um, I have, I'm partly asking personally, partly philosophically. But I mean, uh, uh, the point is, from that last thing you mentioned, you wouldn't find anything like Manny's reasons for a strident asceticism compelling. No. Right. right. No way I'd get kicked out immediately. They wouldn't let me within 20 feet. I'd be like, there's, there's, you know, the Christian thing is but, like, but, there's but, wine in heaven, so I'm down. But, but it's, but it's not <laughs> just that you're not doing it. It's that you don't, you don't see any moral need to it. You don't regard it as a moral failing that you're not doing it. No, I, I think that they're denying yeah. their humanity. I, that's right. the hardest right. part. But I also get, sometimes I don't feel at home, at home here. You know, it depends yep. on the circumstance. But generally speaking, I think that's, I think it's more like disgust sensitivity and also <clears throat> being rejected by the the mainstream i guess I, that, but i could be wrong about that that drives a lot i just think that most of the reasons for his development it, of gnosticism were driven by psychological reasons um and just a hate of i don't know i i don't get people who aren't into the into their body i, I kind of explain this you know what i mean sensations are great i love having sensations um pleasure sensations i love to drink i love to eat i love to have conversations i love to go places i love to do things i don't understand that that uh somehow you get pure by not enjoying like even let's say if if, if, if god made this world okay if we were to go there let's say hypothetically then it's to enjoy it not to hate it and to skew it so i, I yeah i don't get it at all but i also understand the part about individual like uh at the end, that's the one part I did like. 
about I got you. Uh, not one. So, 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 so I get you. So, so there is an aspect of this where I, I heartily agree with you. I think most of the modern world does, but there's definitely an older uh, tradition, a long tradition, and, and it's it's wide. It's it's in it's in not just in Gnosticism. It's definitely in Christianity. It's also there in some uh, philosophy. Uh, it's in Buddhism uh, that there's something about um, uh, uh, the pleasures of the world that are snares, that are traps that are easy to fall into and that distract from uh, the higher, the important things, right? Uh, 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 where, where, your, where your love is, so where your treasure is, there's your heart, right? So the, right, the, I got right the, on the wall downstairs. Right, and, and, and the point is if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if your treasure is in uh, bottles of wine, uh, it's a different thing than if your treasure is, is in philosophy books. Right. I'm a Dionysus, and I like. To <laughs> <laughs> not that the two, not that the two are completely incompatible, in my view, but but <laughs> but, but I, I'm just explaining where that where that uh, where that uh, notion comes from. Um, and, and you definitely find it in um, uh, aesthetic things in Christianity too, uh, among the uh, Christian mystics, for example. Um, uh, uh, so, um, yeah, I. How much of that is psychological? How much of it is uh, a a spiritual practice meant to result in something like practical enlightenment? I don't know. Ask a yogi. Um, you know, I have a different answer, right? Um, but uh, in terms of the how much of this is the psychology of alienness, I, I think an enormous amount. But I don't. I think um, you're right that sometimes you don't feel at home. What's the line in gesture? And he says, uh, uh, "I was told that I was in the right place, and I." Uh, grumbled and tried to accept it with, without much success, right? I was told I was in the wrong place and my heart sang for joy, right? That, that's the line in Chesterton. And what does he mean by that? What he means by that is um, there's a, there's, it's a question of whether or not you can trust your internal reactions to things, right? To the state, to the state you're in, right? If, if every time you have a reaction to something that uh, it feels unjust or that it feels uh, out of place or that it feels tortuous, you, this has to be something where you're supposed to accept it. So you have to bang down like a you know, nail on a hammer on yourself until you accept it, right? The world doesn't change, you change and you change yourself to do it. Then you're always um, second guessing your reaction to things and thinking that there's something wrong with them. If on the other hand, you're told you're in the wrong place that every time you have a reaction that the world is, is wrong or things are messed up, you can believe that reaction. You can trust that reaction. You can run with that reaction. That reaction is telling you something true, right? So there's something liberating, something freeing about believing your negative reactions to things, right? It, uh, it's it's uh, as opposed to fighting against them. Uh, the why is someone fighting against them? They're fighting against them because they're they're worried that they will become you know uh, uh, resentful, poisoned, you know, crabbed if they if they uh, if they don't uh, struggle to accommodate themselves in the world or something like that. Um, but there is something liberating about you know um, uh, saying no. Actually, it's the world's fault. Actually, things are not supposed to be this way, right? Um, and it, it just, it, it makes a bunch of uh, internal reactions to things that you, otherwise you might be fighting against into something you can, you can now actually trust and orient yourself on. I think that that's a huge part of what is appealing in, in this Gnosticism reaction of alienness, of not feeling at home in things, um, because it means you can trust all those reactions. Right, that, before, that you might otherwise, that a stoic would tell you to fight, to struggle against, or something. Um, and yes, there's not only that which psychology. There's also an element of that which might be wisdom. But, um, Chuck, did you have a comment? I did. Um, both uh, leaking you back further into Manichaeism directly itself, um, but also reacting to this notion of the alienness of the world and experience. Um, in a certain sense, um, uh, Buddhism from India uh, in its relatively pristine um, uh, earlier centuries, uh, without having a, a cosmology where uh, there's an alien God or the entrapment of the light or any of that sort, but simply because of the need to uh, abide by the four noble truths and the eightfold path, there's a great deal of renunciation involved. Mm -hmm. There's a great deal of alienation from uh, the pleasures of the world, the temptations of the world involved in Buddhism. 
And uh, I, I, I didn't have a chance to sense uh, how it was that uh, Manny, when he lived, which is fairly late, okay, seven centuries after the Buddha himself in India or more, uh, might have been influenced by Buddhism so that he would consider himself to be a later revelation uh, that incorporates Buddha as a, as a forerunner. Um, so I was also curious to see how much of Buddhist missionary activity occurred in the Mauryan period, uh, the great first great unification of the Indian subcontinent, more or less, just about all of it. Uh, and, and not long after Alexander's conquest mm -hmm. of the Indus Valley. Uh, Indus Valley. Uh, and, you know, Ashoka, the great emperor of that dynasty, did send out missionaries uh, uh, and, and, and at least messengers, mm -hmm. uh, one of whom is supposed to have reached Alexandria and one of the Ptolemies. Mm -hmm. um, but to what extent did Buddhism enter? Uh, the, the Parthian or Seleucid Empire uh, uh, strongly enough that Buddhism could become a significant part of uh, the life of people or the conceptions of them. Mm -hmm. uh, to what extent uh, was uh, any of this uh, truly an integral part of the kind of renunciation uh, for other reasons that Gnostic Manichaeism, Manichaeism would advocate. So I, I think that um, uh, Buddhism doesn't uh, penetrate very far as an actual you know, um, full practice or a, a full religion uh, alongside the other ones in that area in part because there are, you know, other religions on the field, so to speak, uh, that it uh, doesn't uh, manage to uh, overwhelm or penetrate. Um, it does penetrate into Central Asia considerably more. Um, but I think that uh, uh, um, not just Buddhism, but uh, earlier Hindu traditions and metaphysical thinking coming out of India has had more of a, uh, of a purchase and has traveled farther west. Um, you see that even in the classical Greek age as early as 400 BC, um, whether you know signs of um, uh, metaphysical ideas that you can uh, that rec rec are recognizably Indian, or you know you can you can find in some of the Greek mm -hmm. myths or Greek speculation, um, and there's certainly a an enormous amount of um, common background of Indo-European myth. Um, even Zoroastrianism has elements in it which are look like revaluations of things from Hinduism, right? With some of the similar figures with the moral valuations reversed, right? Um, so, so there are there are ideas coming out of India, not just Buddhism, but also Hindu ideas that are influencing both religion and metaphysics to the West um, well before Mani um, and uh, that you know, get as far as Greece and, 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 and Egypt, uh, usually not as far as Rome. Um, uh, that has more of an religious impact on people like Zoroaster, I would say, um, then farther than that. Uh, Zoroastrianism does have an impact through the um, Achmed Persians on the Near East. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's Cyrus who is responsible for, you know, return from the captivity and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and so there are indirect influences like that, but I think it's more the, the metaphysical ideas travel more than the uh, religious practice, moral stuff does. Now, how how much did Manny know about uh, uh, Buddhism and from what? Uh, we don't know. We do know that the Gnostics did get into India. The Hymn of the Pearl is evidence of this. Um, uh, it, it's it's you know said to be uh, in the in the Gospel of Thomas, which is Thomas is the apostle to the Indians. Um, the whole nature of the story has uh, things in common with. Uh, uh, with Buddhism in the sense that it's, you know, it's, it's the prince's journey. Uh, there, there's a, so there, there are, uh, what am I trying to say? Gnosticism was traveling out as far as India and interacting with India before Mani. And he was from a Mani, uh, a, 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 a Gnostic sect that wasn't yet Manichaean sect in Babylon. Um, his fathers had probably read, uh, his father or parents had probably read the Hymn of the Pearl, right? Um, 
so I, I don't I don't know how much um, um, intellectual awareness there was of sort of the full scope of Buddhist traditions in that community, but some of it clearly got to him. Um, uh, yeah, uh, we don't know how much of it he actually had at his at his fingertips. We we can see the the, the places where he has you know some uh, affinities with it and borrowings from it. His borrowings from Zoroastrianism are much larger. His borrowings from Christianity are. Uh, or other uh, Christian Gnosticism are cl clearer than, uh, th than Buddhism. He, but he does mention Buddhist, uh, Buddha as one of his you know, uh, three enlightened predecessors. Um, he thinks of it as one of the sources of enlightenment of a, of a um, uh, outside the world kind of, kind of attitude. Um, uh, I think that part, partly also it's, um, there, are, there are elements you see there in uh, uh, reincarnation ideas in many. That are similar to uh, uh, similar to that, although they may go way deeper and maybe wi way wider. Um, I think the thing, thing that probably attracted him most to Buddhism was was this notion of uh, uh, the enlightenment, the enlightenment as the end of the cycle of re of, of, of resurrections. That that notion was um, clearly something that he used to differentiate the pure from the uh, the listeners or the or, or the fighters or the, uh, uh, the the defenders, right? Uh, so. Uh, anyway, that, that's, I, I don't know beyond that, uh, how much this is influence of Buddhism on the wider culture. I don't think it needs to be. I think it, it can be, you know, influence on him particularly. Um, but uh, Indian ideas weren't just staying in India and they weren't just flowing east, right? Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, generally. Uh <clears throat> So Craig, what's your take on all of this, uh, this stuff in chapter 10 on the uh, relation between Gnosticism and the Greek teacher, uh, and, and the Greeks? Well, I, I spent some time wandering, wandering through uh, uh, the heretical notion that I carry a lot, uh, which ties to what's called environmental history, which is realization that history is not just the acts of humans and cultures of humans and such as that, but uh, much of history is also influenced by environmental factors that may change and, and things that may happen. And that left me really curious as to uh, doing some more research back into what kind of uh, catastrophes, uh, earthquakes, volcanoes, uh, weather events and such happened during this time frame that led to. Okay. Uh, I, I I know you're you're just trying to get at the actual way the, the astrological uh, causation. You know, <laughs> I, I just I just I'm making fun of the, the fact that you're you're you're, re, you're reinventing the the the, hemone, the, the, the cosmic destiny uh, uh, influencing these events. But sorry, keep going. Well, in in a sense. Uh, not necessarily influencing events, you know. I've, I've read Chris Brennan's book on Hellenistic astrology, so so I, I know where the destiny stuff comes in. Ptolemy gets into that a lot too, but but more so the sense of uh, of uh, the orderliness of the cosmos, and uh, maybe the fact that it's not as orderly as they want want it to be, or maybe there's events that have caused that to happen that made it not so orderly. Um, the uh, the other modern version of that is uh, 1816 with the uh, the uh, uh, year without summer uh, due to the uh, eruption of uh, Tambora. And uh, we didn't know that at the time, that it, that it only impacted uh, Europe and upstate New York. And uh, the same time as when uh, uh, Joseph Smith got into his wild ideas, the United community got into their wild ideas as they almost froze to death over that uh, summer that they had no crops. So, so there's, there's always some questions of other influences that go, in, go into that. Um, that kind of leaves me wondering uh, what, what Manny may have experienced that, that led to some of these wild ideas. So that's, that's the one thing that gets there. The, uh, the other aspect is, is this whole sense of trying to emulate the cosmos. Why, why do humans feel like they have to emulate the cosmos? And, and that's the other question that kind of kicks around there a lot is, uh, is wh where, do we, where do we come from with that connection? 
that we feel like we have to emulate the cosmos for good or for bad or or to uh are to fight against the cosmos because we may think it's bad i mean that's those are the kind of things that we're chewing around here in the sense that i wasn't getting a full picture of the whole sense of history that was going on there um so so that's part of what i was looking at is is how do you get these wild ideas that the universe is really pretty screwed up uh and and in the and in the cover of evil rather than in the pure uh good uh nice orderliness that uh that the greeks wanted it to be all right, Jim, 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 Jim has an answer for me, but go ahead. Uh, uh, well, because it was something you had said earlier and I was waiting. Um, it seems to me like the times, because sometimes, well, I'll do this thing again, you know, why emulate and how we feel alien. The times I felt most alien is when I'm surrounded by people that I have zero in common with, and that's most of the time. Um, the best thing that ever happened to me was seeking and finding other people that enjoy the things I enjoy, like philosophy and things like that. Um, I actually got business advice to start having a meetup group at my home with I do the, J, the, the Jordan Peterson meetup. It was uh, you know, good to have people around. But doing that, uh, I got to meet people that I don't have to constantly explain myself to, that uh, seem to understand how I think, even if they don't agree. You know, There's a lot of disagreement. But, Maybe part of it's that, you know, when you feel isolated and there's no one you have anything in common with, you feel like, because we're social beings, you know, um, at least for me, that's what I was thinking. Uh, that's been one of the, the best things for me. And, and like Jason, you know, we're friends and I learned so much from him. And you know what I mean? That, those kind of sure, things. Sure. So I, I, I agree with you, but the real question is, you know, why then, right? So uh, why think, then? Think, th th yeah. things like feeling alien uh, uh, in surroundings where there's people you don't get along with until you find this, uh, a group of people with which you get along is a hardy perennial of human existence, right? And why would it peak right around now and, 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 and have this giant sea change effect in, in, in cultures, right? So what, what was peaking about alienation then, right? And I think there, there are obvious things you can point to. You can point to um, a, uh, uh, the extinguish, extinguishment of political life by the conquest of every separate nation by one uh, political power that then, after exterminating all that political life, proceeds to corrupt its own political life and you know become a, a horror show and a freak show, right? That's alienating, right? Um, in the case of uh, Manny, uh, uh, he's also right on the border between that and and the and the reviving uh, Sassanid Empire, which is trying to have an internal religious revival, but then turns against him. Um, you know, so th those political things may matter a lot for this environment stuff. I mean, uh, there's also just the grand sweep of what Jonas laid out at the, at the very beginning about how all of this is a um, an assimilating invasion of a mythologically thinking East by a, uh, uh, a philosophically thinking uh, Hellenistic world that after it washes over all of them, uh, suddenly starts imbibing all the ideas of the culture that it's trying to assimilate. And uh, so all of that um, religious and mythological thinking bubbles up and seeks an out into the new uh, world in which it has, you know, now been placed. Um, so uh, the, all the different traditions that Manny is putting together are coming from as far afield as, you know, Egypt and India and, uh, and, and, and Iran and, and all that, but they're also impacting a whole Hellenistic world that didn't exist to be influenced by that, you know. 500 years earlier. Um, so uh, I think some of those some of those things, historical things that Jonas lays out are, are, are right. I think some of those things about the end of political life and the move to religious life are right. But those are just questions of when, right? Because when those things happen, what's going to happen? You're going to have a whole culture that focuses on the inward and on the spiritual. And presumably, it's going to discover something about the inward of the spiritual, right? It's not just going to make it up, right? Uh, and and uh, we're going to have, you know, uh, big big discoveries in that, just like you can have big discoveries in art or big discoveries in science, right? Um, and uh, yes, there has to be an occasion for it. You can ask, you know, why this occasion rather than another occasion? Okay, that's fine. But once you start the research project on that occasion, you know, more interesting is what do you find? And that might be occasion uh, uh, coming from the occasion, or it might just be because, you know, now is the time when uh, um, 100 million people are going to seriously look at the problem, so to speak. And that means that you know, 50 geniuses will too, something like that. 
Um, so I, I, I kind, of, kind of getting us into chapter 13. Uh, perhaps. Yeah, in terms of what uh, what Jonas draws the uh, what was the occasion back then and what is the occasion now? Yes, I mean, uh, in chapter 13, which we're not there yet, but he's going to bring up a lot more about, you know, what the scientific world do does to things. Um, but uh, uh, some of these are historical things and some of these are more intellectual things um, in the modern world. But uh, well, at least 13 for 13, it's a good, it's a good subject that we can, we can let it get into. Um, the thing I was trying to get at, uh, Craig, in your response was, um, uh, how to put it? Uh, I, I'm, I'm less interested in the in, in the uh, external of external natural events kind of thing uh, as as causes here. Um, uh, um, there obviously can be personal things that we'll never know about that also influence this, but I, I think they're they're basically unknowable. Um, uh, to me, the, the stuff that you can track is the stuff which is sort of internal to the thought, internal to the cultural stuff, to the references to the uh, physical traditions, to the actual content of it, to the philosophy it relates to, to what it speaks to, human experience, the psychology of it, any of that. That's the stuff you can sort of um, think about and track. And there may have been other, you know, um, spins put on the billiard ball by, uh, by forces beyond that, but you're never going to know them. You would only discover them by the fact that they did something in the in the thought matrix part of it that you can understand that you aren't quite what you expected. It's the only place that leave any trace, right? So uh, to me, the, the thinking about the internals of the thought stuff is, is, is more important than the speculating about exterior causes. Um, in that sense, I'm, uh, I'm an anti-hammer and paint person. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm actually going anti-hammer and in this sense too, because I'm having the the same question about astrology it's it's too much of a closed system it it, it is fixed on the cycles of, of everything that sure. happens and those cycles are fixed and that that's sure. about as deterministic as you're going to get and sure uh, i mean there, there, there are people may not know this but famously the church fathers spent a lot of time arguing against astrology people like augustine clement right it's a very easy takedown right they've got perfectly good rational arguments why astrology is complete horseshit right but yeah. the, the point is they need to make those arguments. They're in an environment where, you know, someone like an Augustine has to do a takedown of why astrology is bunk, right? Yeah. And that's interesting. I mean, I don't, you know, Nietzsche doesn't have to do a takedown of why astrology is bunk, right? Kant doesn't have to do a takedown of why astrology is bunk, but Augustine does have to do that because there are, you know, intellectually serious people around him who don't know yet that it's bunk. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway. Um, Where were we? Uh, yeah, and next time we'll get into the questions I had about virtue too in the same sense. Okay, yes. Yeah, that's 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 really a chapter 11, 11 issue is, is the, is the uh, dynamics of the sense of virtue because uh, in the sense that that, uh, that libertinism that, that kind of comes up is also tied to that sense of virtue in a sense uh, that, that I think we're gonna have to have some more discussions on Next Absolutely. Time. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Plotinus thinks that if you if it doesn't issue in virtue, God is an empty word, right? Um, but the Gnostics don't, and I'm not sure all the Christians do, because if the Christians mean anything, it's that uh, they know they don't have virtue, but they don't think it means they don't have they have to not have God, right? Um, there's a pessimism about the ability to achieve virtue in Christianity that isn't there in someone like Plotinus. Yeah, Plotinus yeah, thinks that as long as you know what virtue is, if you're serious about it, it's easy. Right? Yeah, in Christianity, you can't get there without help from the outside. Right. And for Plotinus, he'd say, of course, you need help from the outside. You have help from the idea of the good, which draws you onward by the beauty, the beauty of the things which is enticing you towards. Right? Um, and you have that sort of psychological sense of causation and nothing more than that. That's yeah. what anything like uh, 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 grace or self overcoming would mean to him. But that means that it's basically being treated as so much a matter of course that it's kind of you know glib and easy. Of course you can achieve virtue if you want it, right? And that's something that the Christians don't think, right? They're much more pessimistic about that. And to I plot- I had a question though. Yeah, about the astrology thing, bunk in the sense that you can easily 
refute its claims as having an objective uh, influence on our lives, but not bunk in the sense that it says a lot, it t t teaches us a lot about how humans uh, <laughs> love to anthropomorphize <laughs> and do those kinds of things. So I think there's, there's a lot of, there's not- Sure, 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 sure. Kind of sure. You, you, you can, you, just like with, with alchemy, you can learn a lot from what people thought about astrology and why they cared about it, right? Both about how they think about necessity and about how they think about mystery and about how they try to, you know, uh, 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 find in intricate systems about obscure things, you know, clues about something. Y yes, you can find out things psychologically about that. The point that I was making about the church fathers is much simpler than that, right? It's that they had claims made by uh, uh, systems of astrology before them, and they could examine and refute them, right? Um, uh, and and did they, you know, had to make philosophical arguments against it, um, which I say, which I, as I say, it's not that hard to do. They don't have you know much going for them as systems, um, but they go through it with incredible patience, right? Incredible meticulousness, right? It's like three books of City of God are just refutations of astrology, right? Um, and because it's something that mattered to them, you know, the overall overall setting is you know did uh, is Christianity the reason that Rome was conquered by the Gauls? No. Okay. So, uh, are, were there were there portents and fates that the Gauls were going to conquer Rome, and are, are, are is is falling away from the ancient religion implicated in that? That's the kind of you know background question in which he has to take up the question, right? But uh, uh, anyway, the, the point that I'm making is is uh, it's not that uh, um, astrology wasn't some sort of you know interesting cultural thing. I think that Jonas is right that it's sort of a uh, an export from Babylonian religion that's you know gone international, so to speak, and been you know, stripped of anything that was too narrow about it. Um, but uh, the interesting problematic sort of thoughts that it does tie into is relations to destiny, fate, caus causality, anything like that, right? But as a claim about how causality actually works in the world, it's hopeless, right? And that's what the, the church fathers were focused on pointing out. Um, the virtue thing, yeah, the, 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 well, any Christian would say, you can't actually achieve virtue, but they're comparing themselves to a perfect God. Because if Christ is the is virtuous, the only virtuous one, then you'll never be that. But trying to get there, you might look like you're virtuous. So the, I, I just think that's an important distinction to make. So, well. so, so, so part, part of it is, is, is whether or not the ideal is lofty. Part of it is also just uh, whether or not the approach is under your control. And, and that's where the, you know, the, the, the Pauls and Aquinas in the world are way more pessimistic than the uh, than the uh, 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 Stoics and the and the uh, 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 and the Plotinuses of the world, right? Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so so uh, the one of the reasons that the classical philosophers like Plotinus treat virtue as so important is because they think that virtue and reason lie close together, and that. Uh, uh, you can get one from the other, right? That, or, or that one leads to the other and vice versa, something like that. Um, and uh, that knowledge is virtue or virtue is knowledge or something like that. And uh, uh, the religious reaction at the, at the time is at least in part based upon um, pessimism about that um, and a not feeling so at home in the world that that's easy. Part of this, you know, feeling feeling trapped in uh, trapped in alien flesh is like I want to do the right uh, right thing spiritually. I see what the right thing is to do, but my body won't do it. I, uh, you know, I, I my my desires won't let me do it. Right? I, I do the opposite instead. Right? And there's a sense in which that's you know my body is disobeying me compared to the uh, 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 Socratic imagining imagining that your uh, reason is in charge of everything. Now, to be fair, you know the the um, uh, the original Platonic psychology knows perfectly well that there are parts of the soul besides the reason, and thinks that the reason being in charge is not easy and requires, you know, the spirited part taming the desirous part, and all this other kind of stuff. Right? There's a whole psychology in Plato, in Plato, but that's not what you're getting here in Plotinus. He's just saying, right, um, if it doesn't issue in virtue, God is a meaningless word, which, from you know, a few removes, amounts to saying the only purpose of God is to teach people to achieve virtue to help them to achieve virtue. It, it makes it instrumental. And it also makes it instrumental in a way that, uh, that treats virtue as the payoff and God as merely the means, right? 
and by the way, it's not God as a means in the sense of God giving grace, it's God as a means in the sense of having correct knowledge about God is all that's required to achieve virtue or something like that. There's something automatic about it. Um, anyway, the, all of that is too pat for the uh, religious and both Gnostic and Christians of the time. They don't buy it. They don't think it's describing their actual situation. Um, I think that this is also related to the thing I was talking about earlier about the attraction of the Manichaeans, and this is certainly true in Augustine. The attraction of the Manichaeans for Augustine is that they seem to be uh, more believable about evil, right? Um, not, not in the sense of something you want to be true, but in the sense of something that seems to be true, right? Evil seems to be original principle alongside good that's forceful in its own right, that's a positive presence, you know, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And, you know, it's, it's hard for uh, uh, Augustine to give that up for this notion that evil is only privation of good. Um, but uh, what am I getting at? Some of these things appeal because they seem to be more uh, brass tacks telling the truth about harsh things about human condition instead of because they're saying things about the human condition which are rosy and everyone would like to be true, right? Um, uh, the, the, the religious uh, counter arguments to the to the uh, stoic view are the uh, um, are calling spades spades something like that um, instead of whitewashing. There's a sense in which the the the, the uh, classical lawsuit that, that they're arguing against seems to be whitewashing or making things too easy on themselves. Anyway, that, that's part of what I got as as reaction to this chapter um, and the beginning of the next one. Um, uh, I think that uh, uh, in the section on, on, on uh, virtue, it is fair to say that that's where the uh, most of the Christians and the uh, apart company with the Gnostics, right? They, they don't want to jettison a notion of, uh, of virtue or just overlook it. Virtue matters to them, but they were pessimistic about its attainment than, uh, than the Stoics and the Plotinians. Okay, um, I've gotten through all the things I want to talk about chapter 10. Um, well, this was a slightly shorter session because we uh, first started recording earlier, uh, later rather, and uh, only had a couple of chapters. Uh, for, let's talk about next time. So next time we're gonna do virtue in the soul in Greek and Gnostic teaching, recent discoveries in the field of Gnosticism, which is especially talking about the Hagnamata and other findings. Uh, and then the epilogue of Gnosticism, nihilism and existentialism, where we're gonna talk about how he relates it to contemporary things. Um, uh, uh, I also note that the, the very conclusion of, of the book, the very last section, uh, page 288, conclusion, the unknown God, right? So he gives a, uh, he gives uh, these things from a, uh, a hymn by uh, Gregorius, the theologian, uh, that uh, says that the, the, the thing which is speaking here in Gnosticism is the notion of the unknown God. Um, leave aside how paradoxical it is to claim that, you know, the notion of the unknown God is what's with illusion Gnosticism, the, the, which is the claim that uh, knowledge is salvation. <laughs> and I told you back when we were talking about the Valentinians, there's something slippery about knowledge of God that uh, 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 it starts off with uh, um, God is completely unknowable, so much so that that's the uh, origin of the divine drama. Um, is the unknowability of God because wisdom tries to understand God and fails, and that's what sets off the entire Valentinian speculation. But at the end of it, he's saying that the Gnostic achieving uh, intellectual union with God by understanding God is what heals is what heals the uh, uh, heals the world. So there's this giant paradox about the unknowability versus knowability of God in Valentinian Gnosticism. Okay, why am I bringing all that up? Because after next time, when we want to sum up a Gnosticism, I want to go on to this book. I'm explaining why another reason why we want to read this book. It's the very end of where Jonas ends as the unknown God. So let's read a book on the unknown God. And uh, Jack wanted to know what's the Platonism he should read to understand the part that actually did influence Christianity as opposed to stuff that just went spinning off into Gnosticism. And, and that's what this is gonna be about. Um, okay. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll, put a, I'll put a link to uh, this. This is um, Amazon page uh, on, on the, below the, uh, this one's meetup and I'll put something on the calendar for it. Uh, the next, the third, sorry, the uh, fourth and last section on Jonas is going to be um, uh, September 5th. Uh, I'll have an event earlier that day, but I'll be able to make it. Um, so September 5th, and that's just the balance of the book and summing up thoughts. And then it will probably be um, 
because I've got trips planned, I will probably be the 26th before we do our actual first session on this. I won't give the specific reading until uh, until next time, but um, it's going to be a, like something like the first three chapters and introduction. Um, uh, but uh, that will be planned for. We'll talk about it on the fifth, and we'll uh, set the reading then. And the 26th is when we when we would actually meet. Uh, sorry, quick question, Craig. Is the 26th bad for you? Is the last Sunday in a month or? Uh, I think what we can do is uh, the other event doesn't start till three o'clock, so uh, so I got a couple hours I can hang into this and uh, okay. And I'll have to be honest with you, some of the topics lately have been kind of dull in the other the end of the group. So uh, you might come here instead. Three. What? Well, another another option is we could move an hour earlier to noon um, to to make uh, to give you more time. Uh, I don't know if that runs into anything for you, Check on Sundays. Uh, no, noon would be a little bit more difficult for me, yes. Okay. Yeah, leave one o'clock today, I could make it. Okay. Leave it at one. Leave it at one. Okay. All right. Good to know. Um, all right. Any more uh, uh, last thoughts or summing up on the stuff we covered today? And I, Before you go there, I might be in sure. Vegas the 26th ah. of September, you're talking, right? So you're free of all worldly things, but you're still going to be in Vegas on the 26th. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know we're near afraid of it, but uh, um, that might be. <laughs> we're planning it now. I'll, I'll know for sure soon. Okay. Okay. Well, do 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 let me know. I mean, it is it's far enough out that we can still move it if we need to, but um, but that's what the plan would be. I I'm I'm hoping. I'm not sure I'm going, but I'm hoping to be in Canada from the 12th to the 19th. So be flying back on the 19th, and if so, I wouldn't be able to be back in time to uh, to start some of the usual time on the 19th. Um, but. Uh, yeah, we'll, let, do let me know what your plans are and, and if anything can move, um, we'll look at it. All right, so uh, that's going to be the plans for uh, one, other, one other thing real quick. Um, you'd also wanted to include the preface to the third edition. At oh, some point. yes. Unfortunately, not everybody has the third edition, I found. A bunch of people have the second. Um, yeah, I, was trying, I was trying to look again in terms of the, uh, the chapter 12 recent discoveries, what, what recent actually means in that sense. Uh, recent right. is 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 not uh, the last 20 years from what i can tell but correct i think that's i think that's recent i think that's recent as of the time of the second edition which would have been in 70 so it's it's really just talking about uh some of the uh yeah as you say the then recent discoveries the the, the third edition perhaps the third edition which is uh uh, uh one. third edition uh paperback was yeah I don't Third think that's in the preface of the third edition was. Is that what it was? 91. 91. 91. 91. And yeah, that sounds more like it. it. Yeah, that sounds more like it. And so the, the, point, the point of the preface of the third, it's not, for, it's not that a bunch of stuff happened in the meantime. It's just that the preface of the third is kind of this autobiographical preface where he's explaining how he came to work on this in the first place um, and uh, uh, what brought him back to it after World War II and, uh, and so forth. But um, it's not that important. I mean, uh, honestly, I think it's I think it's interesting if you're interested in uh, Hans Jonas himself and his life. Um, uh, but uh, I I I'm, I'm I want to make it optional just because not everybody has the third edition. And it's not going to be easy for them to get the the text of it. If you, if if you find the text of it online, we could forward that to someone. That might be useful. But. Um, He gives he gives a nice he gives a nice uh, uh, couple of pages on what was the philosophical situation at the time when I studied in the twenties in Germany. Um, just explains sort of where, where, what he was where he was coming from and how he came to write his dissertation on Gnosticism. Um, yeah, I just finished a really wonderful book. Uh, Anne Harrington wrote a book about uh, holism in the time between uh, Wilhelm II and and uh, Hitler. And it's hmm. fascinating the uh, the history of holism, and uh, and how it got shifted around, and uh, and why Gestalt got such a terrible name, and uh, mm -hmm. and some of the problems with uh, with uh, a number of the people Heidegger included who got tarred and feathered for remaining sensitive to the Nazis. Uh, fascinating book, but uh, but yeah, that 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 whole era, which is also the time frame for quantum mechanics and such as that too, which. Mm -hmm. had a number of, of Jewish people involved in it, a uh, number of German people, Jewish Germans involved in it and such. So. But the main point of, on, on terms of chapter 12, 
there's still another 30 years past this chapter 12 of continued research and studies that uh, the most recent being that Gnostic Bible yep. has a lot of the stories about that. So, so as, as we look into that, uh, bear in mind that this is more of a snapshot in time halfway between their discovery and now than it is the final word on it. Yes, definitely true. I want to mention one other thing. I know several people have talked about Young uh, uh, today and, and previously. Um, Young was involved in saving some of these manuscripts. I don't know if people know that, but there's if, if one of the Gnostic uh, manuscripts, Stevens, it's called the Young Manuscript. It's called the Young Manuscript. Young. He, right. Yeah, the young he, codex, right. Because he managed to get it. Basically, someone got it out of uh, Egypt, uh, hoping to sell it to collectors in Europe. And that was violating a bunch of uh, Egyptian laws and the removal of, of antiquities. So to, in order to get it in the public domain, you had the problem that the guy who had spirited out of the country had to be paid off. And then the Egyptian laws had to be complied with to return it to a museum in order for it to be able to be made available to scholars. So Young finessed all that by just you know, buying it and paying everybody off and getting it to the museum, you know, giving up custody of it basically um, because he wanted to get it in the public domain. But that was his, his involvement in some of, these, uh, some of these texts was to get them from the people who are trying to profiteer on them back into the hands of uh, the legally allowed authorities. Sorry, go ahead, Joe. Uh, yeah, I wanted uh, first to uh, have you uh, repeat the name of the author. Because if I got her, which, if I picked up her last name, I could just awesome. go straight to Amazon. So what is it? I just Car put the link. Carabine. Carabine. Amazon's in the chat. Yeah. Oh, the you did. Amazon is in the chat. You did? I didn't yep. see it in your chat. The the Amazon thing. Uh, uh, is that right? Yes. Uh, Negative theology, Platonic. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's it. Okay, let, let, me check, let, let, let me check the link and make sure it's the right one. Yes, that's it. Yeah, I already have the okay. book. Okay, the Carabine. And, 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 and like by the way, it's, it's like 30 to odd dollars? 35 almost uh, with tax. Well, that's, that's no surprise. But uh, okay, and then also that third uh, preface that, uh, that I don't have because I have the okay, yes. edition. And I know Czech doesn't have it either. No, I do. Uh, oh, you oh, do? You have the third? Yes, I do. The red one? I have the one with the red cover. I have the one with the yellow cover. So I can lend that to you. That's sufficient. I was wondering how long it would be. Could somebody make a PDF of it? But, uh, got it. Got know. it. So so we, we will include it. I'll put it on the on the actual invite. But we will include for the readings next time, preface to the third edition uh, after all the other stuff to just talk a little about uh, Hans Jonas' uh, biographical stuff. It's very interesting stuff about the Philosophical situation. Hold, the time hold up one writing. more time, Deirdre. Deirdre, I want to see the one more time. Deirdre Carabine. Okay. All right. All right. Almost like the rifle, but not quite. Yes, it's got an extra A in it. <laughs> so. The short rifle has an extra A in it. Oh, I checked. I think that is the right link that I posted in the chat. I did check. It's the right one. Yeah. All right. Uh, a lot of end matter here, but that's fine. Um, anybody else have more substance or should we uh, adjourn until next time? All right. Thanks everyone again for showing up. Great conversations as usual and uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.